Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Marshall Way. Uh, this week, uh, we have the honor of having Shihan Cameron Quinn with us. Uh, Cameron Quinn is the author of the Budo Karate of Masuyama. Uh, he was an Uchideshi under Sosai Masuyama, as well as a translator and, and uh, a longtime friend of Sosai. Um, a lot of people that I've been just talking with lately, uh, it comes up all the time, even just recently with Tom Callahan. He's like, you you have to speak to uh, Shihan uh, Cameron Quinn. You have to have him on there. Uh, just a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of history. I know a lot of people have been waiting for this one. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcome uh, Shihan Cameron Quinn. Good morning. How are you going? Good afternoon. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. So that was one of the challenges. I know I've been uh, trying to arrange this with you, but it's that massive time difference. So uh, you're, you're basically you're in the future. So don't give away anything. I bought a lottery ticket today. If you already know the numbers, you can let me know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so you. Well, you're, sorry. No, we're we're like uh, nine hours ahead, but twenty years behind. So if you can work <laughs> that one out, you know. <laughs> Well, so we're exactly – you're in Brisbane, correct? No, I'm – well, close to Brisbane. Uh, if if you describe where I live from overseas, I'd say Brisbane. But I actually live about uh, 70, 80 kilometers from Brisbane. Okay. Um, I was born and bred on the Gold Coast, but my main dojos were in Brisbane and then – when my family started to grow up, I moved back to the Gold Coast. And for the last couple of years, I'm at a place called Tambourine Mountain, which is the hinterland of the Gold Coast, which is uh, it's not far from both. It's a triangle, Brisbane, Gold Coast, and uh, Tambourine Mountain. Mm -hmm. Nice area. Yeah. I, I, and we were discussing right before this call, I think I'd rather be in your area of the world right now than mine, where it's uh, it's pretty chilly and snowy. Uh but uh, maybe we could switch. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't mind the snow. I can always put a jacket on. But when it hits 35 degrees here, you take your shirt off. There's only so far you can go with no shirt. So, yeah. <laughs> Got to find a balance somewhere along the line. Yeah. So uh, you are, I mean, you are a legend in, in Kyokushin. I mean, your name comes up quite a bit. Um uh, and so as I was re researching about you, I was actually trying to stay away from um, interviews with you, um, not because I wasn't interested, obviously I was, but I didn't want to get into, um, re I don't, I don't want to rehash any questions, I don't want to get into that thing, I just want to have a conversation for sure. But if I do ask you things that you've been asked a million times, I, <laughs> I apologize ahead of time. Um, but uh, I'm very, very interested. You don't have to, you know, I think. When you say I'm a legend, I think that's kind of funny because I, I consider people like Sosai and Bobby Lowe and uh, Howard Collins and uh, people like that, they're legends to me. Mm -hmm. I just happen to have been in the right place at the right time. Really, it literally comes down to being in the right place at the right time, you know. And so people, you, we forget it's been, you know, 23 years since Sosai died. So, uh Probably 80% of the, well, 90% of the tournament fighters in the world today weren't even alive when Solsai was born. Right. Oh, when Solsai was uh, still with us. So, of course, they're intrigued. If, you know, if I think about great personalities through history and if I found someone who uh, actually lived with them and knew them, of course you'd want to know more about them so I mean it's it's people ask me stuff about Solsai all the time and I'm just 100% happy to repeat the same stories over and over if that's what they want to know because you know um, we we certainly owe a lot to Solsai so the more we can talk about Solsai the more comfortable I am actually. Mm. Well, and leading to that, how I mean, you said it was uh, you know right place, at the right time, and a lot of life is like that. But uh, how did that come to you? Um, I know that you got into Kyokushin very young, and, and you can uh, speak to that. But we're talking at a time uh, I don't want to uh, age you or date you too much, but this was before internet. It was before any kind of social media things of that nature. So how does a kid? Before cassettes, before, cassettes. before CDs, <laughs> That's before <right>. DVDs. <laughs> That's right. So how does a kid with uh, n none of that stuff end up in Japan from Australia? 
So, uh, for, so I guess let's back it up. How did you get into Kyokushin, and then how did you make your way to Japan at that early age? I think, honestly, I got into Kyokushin by accident, really. My, I had uh, older sisters. I've got four older sisters. Mm -hmm. And uh, my parents, back in 1971, my parents, uh, a, a, a dojo, a martial arts school had opened up on the Gold Coast. Uh, and there was some reasonable coverage in the local newspaper. And my parents wanted to have my sisters learn some self-defense. They weren't worried about me. I was young enough and I was actively involved in all kinds of sports and so on. But uh, they, they were more concerned about my sisters. So one night they took my sisters to this martial arts school and I just tagged along. I was a little 12-year-old kid tagging along. And I think they were completely not interested. They, you know, it was just like they were rolling their eyes kind of, we don't want to do this. But I couldn't get enough of it. I just had up. I remember standing at the back of the class with no gear on, just invited myself in and started to do the basics along with them. And I had no idea what I was doing, but I instantly fell in love with the energy and the vibration of the whole uh, dojo. And that's where it began, really. And, and that was a Kyokushin dojo. And it just, that's why, yeah, by coincidence, it was a Kyokushin dojo. If it was a, a different dojo, perhaps I would have got more actively involved with that. But I think then what I did was, well, I, be, you know, I was always enjoying reading and so on. So I used to sell newspapers and, and save money and uh, or work weekends. I used to work as a room service uh, bell hop in a few of the uh, local uh, holiday resorts because my town service paradise is a holiday destination. And I, you know, I'd save money and buy books, save money, buy books. So I, I, you know, and I found the books of Masayama. I remember I bought This Is Karate for $14 and it was probably the biggest purchase of my life. Uh, and then I found What Is Karate and Advanced Karate and, you know, just an endless stream of books. And, and when I realized that, that uh, these books, you know, What Is Karate and This Is Karate were about the style of karate that I did. And still at this stage, I don't think I really had a clear idea of what the difference in styles were. Uh, you know, my own instructor, Frank Everett, was a fantastically uh, inspirational personality. He really got a lot, got a lot out of the students and, and encouraged uh, students very beautifully. And he's, his background was boxing. Mm. He was an undefeated Golden Gloves boxing champion. And, very well known in that amateur boxing world in Australia. <laughs> he then, and yes, yeah, so are you there? Right, can we you got, hear me? Right, we got cut. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you now. I can't see you, but I can. Uh, I can hear you. Okay, let me see what I can do about the. Yeah, if you could turn your video back on. How's that? There you go. Yeah, we were just talking about how good the internet connection was, and then that happened. So, anyway. Well, anyway, um, yeah. so Kato Shigio Shihan, he was uh, a student of Soul Size, mm -hmm. a very, very uh, highly respected student in Japan, but not really well known outside of Japan. Uh, and he was the uh, instructor of, of Shoke Matsui, the head of IKO1. Yes. And in my opinion, probably one of the greatest. Uh, karate technicians ever. But anyway, he, he came, he was sent to Australia in, I think, around 67 or 68, and my instructor, Frank, immediately took to him because they were similar build. From Frank Everett, my instructor, was five foot four, uh, and Kato Shigio was probably around the same size. So, uh, you know, Frank was inspired by that. I remember the first, funnily enough, I remember the first time I walked into the dojo and Frank was five foot four and I remember looking at it, looking up at him thinking, boy, oh boy, if I train really hard, I'll be as big as him one day. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. I, I'm sure so you should anyway, ask that. How tall are you now? Just out of curiosity. Uh, about 5'10". But I <laughs> so, guess as you get older, you start to shrink back again. Well, I must say, yeah. I, I, I developed, I became fascinated in the physiological effect of training. And I started to look into it at one stage there. 
I remember in grade 11, I was doing an essay and see my, in grade 11 at school, I was still four foot 10, mm. which is like 145 centimeters or something like that. I don't know, 155 centimeters, maybe 145 centimeters it is. So I was very small for my age. And my uncle was a jockey, and so all the family talk was, you know, I was never going to be that big. But then I started to look into uh, the effects of certain training um, methodologies. And I started to read up a little bit on primal screaming, which I guess was a therapy designed to help people with certain types of um, trauma and so on. But I realized that you could almost – you could almost uh, translate ki as primal screaming, mm. you know, because of the ki is a primal energy mm -hmm. and the, the I, you know, to meet your, your primal energy. So I, I instantly became interested in this concept of primal screaming. I didn't really take it into any depth, of course, because it is a probably far deeper than I ever took it. But I pretty well stopped right there, actually. Primal screaming, ki -ai makes a lot of sense. Let me do more ki -ais and let me do louder ki -ais than anyone else. And then uh, as another aspect of my uh, physical education subject training at high school, uh, I had to do a paper on um, one technique or one aspect of some sport. So I chose the front kick in karate. But in the process, I was looking into the effects of – uh, high intensity training on developing youth on on the effect and the effects of of high levels of intensity not just you know average regular training but very high levels very high intensity levels of training on the development of bone tip growth and I, I was looking into how uh, extreme levels of, of training would stimulate the, the bone tip growth in developing youth. And I thought as a five, a four foot 10 kid who wanted to be five foot 10, uh, that's straight down my alley. I'm gonna combine these primal screaming key eyes with lots and lots of repetitions. And so I, I was training in grade 11, I really picked up the pace. Before then my karate was like grade eight, I trained sporadically because it was a long way from the house to the dojo, uh, grade, Nine and ten, I hardly trained at all, to be quite honest, because I was involved in rugby. Mm. I was doing a lot more rugby, and then uh, I was at boarding school. I went away to boarding school for a couple of years, so there was no dojo at the boarding school, so I was only training on holidays, pop my head in every now and then. I, I, you know, uh, uh, I must say at boarding school it, became, it was interesting because we had kids from all over the world, and there were some Chinese kids there who used to do – um, certain types of very hard kung fu, and I became fascinated with that. Um, they'd never let us train. It was like still, you know, secret training, and it was 72, 73, and Bruce Lee had died in June 73, so there was lots of talk at boarding school about Bruce Lee and kung fu, and so that kept the, the flames going. But then uh, when I started to read up on primal screaming and, and bone tip stimulation as a result of heavy levels of exercise, I just went into the dojo and literally trained seven days a week. Oh, wow. We had, my instructor Frank had three dojos and I would go from one dojo uh, to, to the next. My parents got a little tired of it, so at one stage there I must have annoyed them so they stopped taking me. <laughs> so I would hitchhike. I would get out and I would hitchhike to training. Uh, and nine times out of ten, it was other karate guys that recognized me and picked me up and take me to training. But I would go from one end of the Gold Coast to the other end of the Gold Coast to these different dojos. And I trained seven days a week. And it's not because I was uh, anything special. I was, uh, was absolutely nothing special. But what I did was just train absolutely consistently and I'd get up in the morning, I'd do all my basics, I'd get home from school, I'd do all my basics and Carter and then I'd go off to training and we'd train, well Frank would do a beginner's class and then the seniors class for two hours so I'd, I was training probably four hours minimum a day, maybe five hours and only only two of that was really, really hard. 
The first hour at training was more technical to introduce beginners to some techniques. And the other stuff I was doing was just doing all the basics and everything, and that wasn't really that hard. Um, but the amazing thing was all these loud key eyes and all these uh, repetition, I grew like uh, 22 centimeters in one year. Wow. And really I shot up so much. And uh, thank heavens my mum was a dressmaker before she was married because she had to make new clothes for me every two or three months, you know. Um, but anyway, there's a good testimony to, first of all, the physiological effects of massive volumes of good quality uh, training. You know, one of the most beautiful stories I remember about uh, uh, Muhammad Ali was once he was asked in a press conference before he fought Sonny Liston, mm -hmm. how many push-ups can you do? And he, he thought for a while, and he, he said, not too sure, maybe 22 or 23, around that. And even the journalists were a little bit surprised that so they probably just changed the subject out of embarrassment. And then after the press conference, he did a, a workout and he did the rounds and the sparring and the speed ball and the push-ups and, I mean, the uh, punching bag and so on. And then he started to do push-ups. He got down, he started to do push-ups and he just kept doing push-ups. And 10 minutes later, he's still doing push-ups and a quarter of an hour later, he's still doing push-ups. And then finally he stopped and went and had his shower and then later on afterwards they had another mini press conference and, uh, and, uh, they said to him, well, we asked you before how many push-ups you could do. You said 22 or 23. But we just watched you do like 250, 260 push-ups. What gives? And he said, no, well, I just keep doing push-ups till I can't do any more push-ups. And then I do another 22 or 23. And, <laughs> and, and that, that became a little bit of a, a, a mantra, if you like, yeah. in – in training for me, I just, you know, tried to do as much as I could, not because I wanted to be a, the greatest karate fighter. That wasn't even in my brain, to be quite honest. I just wanted to get taller. I just wanted to get bigger and stronger. And that's that's a, a fantastic aspect of the physiological effects of, of good, solid training. And now I spend a lot of time teaching kids. Mm. And you can see it from, from month to month, literally – you know, I've got one brother and sister, Nate and Shay, who started training with me about uh, uh, just under two years ago. And Shay, Nate's the older brother, Shay's the younger sister. Uh, and the difference in height is just unbelievable. And then we have another one, Dylan and Caitlin. And now Caitlin has started wearing her older brother's gi that he bought 18 months ago, and he has to buy a new gi. The, the, it's beautiful the physiological effects that doesn't even talk about the the psychological effects of training you know yeah absolutely yeah and I, and the marriage between the two and one affecting the other yeah for sure so so uh so at what point so you went to how did so how did you get to japan at, at an early age how did that come about yeah well that's kind of an interesting story too i once i realized that my instructor, Frank, was a student of Kato Shigio, and he was a student of Masayama, and I had the, the books of Masayama. I just wanted to get to Japan to uh, train with Masayama. There was, there was, there was, that was my, that became my, you know, it, it's like everything I wanted to do was aimed at getting into Japan. I didn't even know what that meant, really. Right. But anyway, so on weekends, I'm working. I was working as a uh, bellhop, as I said, and I was saving my money furiously. And and I realized it doesn't matter really how much I save. And even if I got a leg up from my parents or something, I was only going to be able to stay in Japan for a minimum amount of time. Mm. So then I, I thought, okay, well, how can I go to Japan and experience training and live there for as long as I can but get paid to do it and and you know at this stage I'm 16 mm -hmm. years old I don't even again I don't I just knew that I, I needed to somehow work out a way where I could get to Japan but not have to pay for it <laughs> right pretty industrious and, <laughs> uh, yeah you know, what can I do so and then one day at school I met 
this Japanese exchange student. His name was Shuji Ozeki. Mm -hmm. And he and I are still very close friends, almost family friends to this day. Uh, and there's another great story there too, which I'll tell you later. Absolutely. But Shuji, Shuji was a Rotary exchange student and it clicked. I thought, here's my way to get to Japan and get paid for it, uh, apply for a study scholarship. Mm -hmm. So I looked into it, found out what I needed to do to get a scholarship to go and, and live and train. I live in Japan. I didn't tell them I wanted to train. You know, I think it's uh, we, we joke about it now, but I told them that I wanted to be a cultural bridge between our two societies. Wow. Really all I wanted to do was just go and train. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I won this Rotary Exchange Scholarship and I ended up living, getting, all I had to pay for was my airfares. Wow. Day-to-day -day expenses. And Rotary sponsored my accommodation. You know, I lived in with four families and went to school in Japan, uh, studied Japanese language, you know, diligently enough, I was never a, um, you know, a, a super focused student, but I, I made sure I did about one hour every day for the first three months. I got a lesson every day for one hour for the first three months. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I got a lesson once a week and I would study for one hour every day. Mm -hmm. So it was just, it was just consistency more than superhuman effort. It was just consistency. So there you go. That's I, I decided to go to Japan. I tried to work out how I could do it for free. I won the Rotary Exchange Scholarship. I went and lived in Japan as a Rotary student for a year, and that's how I got to train at Hombu. That was pretty industrious of, of a 16-year-old kid <laughs> to do that. That's, well, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> it actually shows yeah, what kind of person you are even at an early age. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, again, it was just nothing special. It was just that's like – clever though. Well, I, well, it's just like you, you have this purpose, you know, right. you, uh, and when you have purpose, you can pretty well do anything and get anything, get anywhere, Absolutely. you know, and, Absolutely. and I have to say there are since then, like when I was there in Japan at the time, there was only one or two foreigners training at Hombu and before me, my inspiration, why I mentioned Howard Collins before, but because he had been to Hombu and trained there and he was, he and Brian Fitkin were just legendary uh, personalities. Mm -hmm. Other foreigners had been there, but they were the two that really stood out as being particularly special. Mm -hmm. uh, since then, you've got all kinds of um, people have gone and spent periods of time in Japan. And even you had, uh, you know, Nick Pettis uh, mm -hmm. went back to White Belt and became an Uchi Deshi for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, Judd Reed from Australia also was an Uchi Deshi for three years. Uh, you know, this is just amazing stuff to me. I think that's very inspirational. There is no way that I, at that point, could have been an Uchi Deshi for three years. It just it wasn't in my brain. So good on them. Yeah, yeah. yeah I had Judd on uh, recently. Actually, Judd was my first guest uh, on the podcast, and uh, yeah, he's a he's a very in inspiring uh, gentleman for sure. Uh, his uh, his story. Uh, it's. Uh, it could be easily could be a movie it's uh and yeah, hopefully indeed. someday maybe it is it'd, it'd be great um so when you went there only john will make it happen <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so when you went uh there so you were actually training at hanbu dojo then your first on your first uh foray to japan yes i, I not the whole time because uh well that's what i, I was wondering. had very little yeah i had very little uh control over um uh, where I would end up as an ex exchange student. I, if I ended up in Tokyo, living near Hombu, mm -hmm. I could have trained there seven days a week if I like. But the trade-off is, if I I realized this later on, I kind of regretted that I didn't live closer to Hombu. Uh, but the trade-off was, if I had lived in Tokyo, I probably wouldn't have studied and learned Japanese as efficiently because there was there was a, a, a large non-Japanese presence, a lot of Americans, uh, military-based Americans and things like that. A lot of yeah, – anywhere – to me, Tokyo is kind of like this satellite, alien satellite city in Japan. It's, it's not really Japan. It's, it's, it's this alien nation of its own. If you really want to experience Japan, learn the culture, 
learn what Japanese traditions and so on are, get out of Tokyo and go and live in the country. And so I was based in the country uh, and it was a train ride um, into Tokyo. So I went into Tokyo fairly early. I got through to my uh, host parents that this my main purpose was I wanted to go and train with this man, Masoyama. They hadn't really heard of him. Uh, one of one of my host parents had a Goju sixth stand friend. Oh, yeah. And, of course, he had heard of him. So the compromise was I could go to Tokyo and train on weekends where they like Golden Week and, and weekends where they had public holidays and school holidays and, and you know, winter holidays, summer holidays, um, weekends, things like that. As long as I – but the trade-off was, well, we'll let you do that, but – um, train at the Goju Dojo in the town. So I got to train with this. Well, actually, he introduced me to a man named Arai Sensei. And Arai Sensei was a fourth Dan who was a direct student of Yamaguchi Gogen. Oh. And, and I, so I trained with him. I actually got my black belt in Goju whilst I was in Japan as well. Oh, wow. Uh, but, I didn't know that. That's incredible. Yeah. I love Goju. I think it's a great style. But um, uh, my primary thing was getting to Hombu and training at Hombu and it was just an amazing time to be there. Some of the personalities that were there were just incredible and that's where I first met Solsai. So what was that, that meeting of Solsai, what was that like? Well, he heard that there was this young Australian kid training so he called me up after training one day. The secretary's name then, Solsai's secretary was a, a lady named Christine Wilby. And she was a New Zealand girl, and I'd met her, of course. And after training one day, the instructor said, oh, Sosa wants you to go up to the office. So I'd met So the first time was when I was actually signing in at the front desk. I'm signing my name and trying to fill in the form, and uh, I heard the, a, a big rustle of, of activity behind me, and it was Sosa coming in. And so I just stood there and... Well, and, you know, of course, it takes your breath away. Literally, his aura and personality are incredibly vibrant. So it literally takes your breath away. And he looked at me and smiled with this beautiful smile and walked over and shook my hand and said, oh, welcome to my dojo. And that's all he said. And and then a couple of weeks later, um, that's when he called me up to the office. Mm -hmm. And I went up to meet him and awesome. I just, you know, I remember he looked up at me and my legs almost gave way and then he smiled again. You see, he, he really had this ability to uh, make people feel warm. He could, he could, if he was angry with you, you don't want to be within a mile because he, the, his, the power that he would generate would literally make your legs shake. But, and remember, I'm 17 years old at this point. Right. So, I'm still very young. And, and, but when he would smile, he would give you energy. And, and so, oh, big smile on his face. Please sit down, sit down. You know, and he'd come in and sit down, have a cup of tea, and he'd talk and, and so on. And then, uh, and this is how the journey continued. He would come down to training. Uh, I was training. My main instructor at Hombu was Hiroshige Shihan. Mm -hmm. Hiroshige Shihan was the one who trained uh, Midori, Yamaki, mm -hmm. Kazumi, yes. all these great fighters. His dojo was uh, quite significant. And he was, he was a brown belt then at Hombu. Oh, wow. And he was my main instructor. And Sosai would come for one, one class a week. And then he would come, but he would come down at the end of training every day mm -hmm. and he would say something and in the early days I had no idea what he was saying uh, eventually I started to after six months started to pick up the language more and um, those little uh, visits by Salsa were you know pretty special uh, and then uh, after six months I'd come after six months of coming and going briefly. I was able to go during my summer holidays. 
I extended my summer school holidays. Remember, I was at high school, yes. so I couldn't take too much time. So I think I went back for an unbroken period of about six weeks and trained every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was it's not a big thing to train every day. You're only training a couple of hours. So, you know, you've got plenty of time to rest and plenty of time to see the sights of Tokyo and things like this. My routine was I'd get up, I'd catch the train to the dojo, I'd train in the morning class. They call it Ichibu. There was Ichibu, Nibu, Sambu, three classes a day, and I'd train in the morning class. And then I'd go from there to Shakey's Pizza. <laughs> Shakey's Pizza was 500 yen mm. for all you could eat. Mm-hmm. And I was this 17-year-old kid who was just starving. And I think 500 yen in those days was about a dollar twenty-five, a dollar thirty. Mm-hmm. So all you can eat for a dollar thirty. It was just like this is I've died and gone to heaven. It so I'd be cards. starving, training, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I'd just eat and eat and eat, and and that's what gave me energy. And then I'd spend a little bit of time visiting places. I was actually staying in a place called Yoyogi, which was just uh, not too far from Shinjuku, and. My host family in the country, their family, their cousins, had this very big house in Tokyo that was a family house. And so I was able to stay there for free for the wow. for the durée whenever I came to tra- Tokyo. So it was very convenient. Uh, so that was my routine. Get up, train, go to Shakey's, eat, eat as much food as I could eat, and then go home and rest, you know. It was fun. And at those times, uh, and when you were meeting Sosai, was he, could he speak any English at that time? Or yeah, he understood. I think he understood more than people realized. He, you know, he had spent enough time in America to develop a good ear for English. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, he got pretty good at understanding it. But you got to remember, he was Korean-born Japanese, yes. so yeah. he spoke Japanese with a fairly strong Korean accent, mm-hmm. and. It became a bit of a, a skill to understand his Japanese as well. Mm-hmm. You know, not not the big things. You could, you know, he'd say something and you could understand ninety percent of it. But it was small things that that took a little bit of experience to understand exactly what he meant because of his accent. And I became, I guess, because I was just learning Japanese, hearing his Japanese almost became like getting used to a different dialect. Right. So I became quite good at understanding his Korean sounding Japanese. Right. And I remember building up to the eighth All Japan, which is just crazy when you think about it, because I think we're on the 48th All Japan yeah. now or the 49th. But the eighth All Japan uh, was in, I believe, October 1976. And by this stage, I've been training at Hombu quite a, a lot. And... Sorsai called me up to his office again and he said, we've got an event coming up and he was looking at the calendar on the wall. It was in Japanese, but I read in Japanese uh, that it was the Zen Nippon All Japan Karate Championship. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, the All Japan Karate Championship. He looked at me and said, oh, you can read that. And I said, yeah. And by this stage, you know, I'd been in Japan for um, six or seven months and so I just started to get a a better feeling for hearing it. First six months I was lost, but after that it came fairly quickly. Mm. And he said, look, we've got some delegates from overseas coming. Can you come and do the translation for it? I said, yeah, sure. Uh, that would be great. And so that was my first official translating job for Salsa. I was the eighth all Japan. We had Shihan Bobby Lo, Shigeru Oyama, Yasuhiko Oyama, Miyuki Miura. Um, we had... Uh, a guy named Clarence Fong, who was a lawyer from um, from uh, Hawaii, who was a close, um, I guess, dojo supporter of Bobby Lo Shihan. Mm-hmm. Then we had o- Oyama Shigeru had brought some uh, different students, a, a Joe Claranino and a guy named uh, um, Eddie Frazier. These were fighters. Eddie Frazier competed yeah. in the tournament. I got on really well with Eddie Frazier because my middle name is Frazier and my mum's maiden name was Frazier. So it's like 
you know, we didn't even see he was African American and I was like Anglo Saxon, but it didn't matter. It's like we must have been related somewhere along the line. So it was anyway, we got on really well. And that was my first interpreting job. Was, oh, and there was Luke Hollander. I met Luke Hollander, um, uh, Peter Chong, wow. um, Ivan Zavachanos from Australia. Uh, you know, there was, it was just this amazing. And I'm sitting there at dinner one night chatting to this really nice Japanese guy, and I was amazed at how good his English was. And it turns out it was Miyuki Miura Shihan. Oh. You know, and I'd only read his name in uh, uh, in This Is Karate. So all of a sudden, you know, I thought, wow, I'm, these are some pretty seriously big personalities. Steve Arneal was there as well. Uh, you know, so what a great way to meet all these people. And it, it really was very valuable to my long-term uh, Kyogushin uh presence if you like because I got to know all those people way back then and uh, it was a great position of privilege to translate for Salsa but like I said I was just in the right place at the right time you know yeah it's pretty amazing and, and what was it like to be I guess training and, and, and around in the gaze of Sosai all the time like that yeah I mean uh, not just Sosai but some of the other right, all instructors these- yeah. You know, there was a guy named Nakamura Tatsuo. Yes. He had the most stunningly beautiful kicks. In fact, he knocked me out cold my first training session that I was there. Just, I remember, and Christina Wilby said, look, they're going to test you. They're going to put pressure on you. But just just say awesome, and get up and keep going, and it'll settle down after a while. <laughs> so sure enough, I'm sparring away, just wang this beautiful roundhouse kick I didn't even see. Because you've got to remember, before the first world tournament, Kyokushin around the world, except perhaps for um, Shigeru Oyama in New York, Mm -hmm. uh, Howard Collins and Brian Fitkin in Sweden, Steve Arneal in England. Even Steve Arneal was in England at an earlier generation, pre-Kyokushin tournament generation. So there weren't, you know, I'd say Howard Collins was probably the the first real uh, non-Japanese tournament champion fighter and Brian Fitkin. Those both were the ones that came to Japan and really picked up on the Japanese style of of tournament fighting and kumite. But other than that, like uh, in my dojo, we were – we didn't even understand shin kicks the way – you know, Mawashi Getty with a shin had been done because this is, you know, pre world, uh, pre world tournament one. You know, mm. the world tournament was in, in seventy five, mm-hmm. and in the seventy one, two, three, you know, it was still almost, I would say, almost goju in style. And if you watch the old videos, um, as a, um, a fantastic guy in, in New Zealand named um, Shihan Doug Holloway. Oh yes. And Doug Holloway was the first non-Japanese to train at the Hombu Dojo. And he was there as a young man. And it's funny because uh, you get a lot of people talk about how hard they trained at Hombu. I never really tell people how hard I trained at Hombu because I know that there are people who really did train hard. For me, to be quite honest, at 17, it was enough for me to train as hard as I could but just survive, really. I, I literally... For me, quite honestly, from day to day, surviving the Kumite was a challenge enough for me. But you get uh, Doug Holloway went over there. He was also about 17 or 18, but this is back in the 60s. Mm. And uh, recently I was talking to Oishi Shihan, um, and he actually was talking about Doug Holloway. And he said, you know, we used to get a lot of foreigners come in and talk about how hard they trained and everything. He said, but Doug Holloway really did train hard. He said he... He, you win the hearts of the Japanese with your training consistency, mm-hmm. and he was just great. And he, he had a really good fight brain, and the Japanese guys really fell in love with him. You know, he's a lawyer now, and um, he's still involved in Kyokushin. But he had some beautiful Super Eight footage when he was um, leaving. Sosai allowed him to go into the dojo and shoot some filming, some um, video footage of. Uh, the Kumite, 
And so you look in this thing, you've got uh, you've got um, Kato Shigio and all these Oyama Shigeru and all these uh, Yasuhiko Oyama and and uh, all these famous personalities in Kumite at the dojo. And so if you watch them, this is pre-tournament Kumite. So they're almost fighting from a, a back stance. Yep. They've got their hands wrapped with a little towel. They wrapped their, a towel around their hands because they didn't have mitts or they didn't want to use gloves. And it, their hands wouldn't be up here. The hands are like, you know, this sort of thing where they're – and there were sweeps and then they'd punch in the face and they'd sweep them to the ground and – and the, the kicks to the head were with the ball of the foot. And, you know, it was just a fascinating insight uh, about what training was like back then. Mm -hmm. So uh, the rest of the world still didn't know what Hombu was like pre-world tournament. And even Japan was very different. It's only after the world tournament and, and training – you know, the, the influence of Muay Thai and training right. uh, and going to the first world tournament for the world and seeing all these Japanese guys just smash guys with leg kicks and smash guys with with uh, shin kicks to the head and so on. That's what really changed the way the world trained and approached um, uh, Kumite. So the difference between the first world tournament and the second world tournament is quite significant. And uh, so, you know... Um, when I arrived at Hombu, I still didn't have any really clear concept of this, you know, mawashi gettys with your shin and, and thigh kicks with the shin and so on. So my first day of training in Kumite, I got Nakamura Tatsuo, uh, just knocked me out cold. Boom, and I went down and, and I thought, well, I better get up because Christine, Christine told me to get up. So I get up and then he kicked me again, but this time I had my hand up. But my hand came in and, and hit my nose and blood went everywhere. And I still couldn't speak Japanese. So I'm lying on the ground <laughs> in a day feeling sorry for myself. And all of a sudden, all the Japanese were running around. I thought, oh, finally, they're going to show some compassion. You know, they're going to – and Nakamura Tatsuo just looked at me and said, you, Gaijin, go, go. All they were worried about was my blood <laughs> stained floor of the dojo, you know, the, the – Blood in Japanese culture is a dirty thing, so they don't like to have blood. Or, so they just get out of the way. We just want to clean up your blood. They, they didn't care about me, you know. But I just came back the next day, and, and I just came back, and I paid. And that's one beautiful thing about paying your fees in advance, you know. You, you, you've already paid, so you've got to get your money's worth. So you go back the next day, you see. So I, I just kept going back, and uh, after a while, you get – used to it and you get stronger and you have I had no idea um, how much stronger it was making me but what would happen is every time I'd go to Hombu after a few days I'd go back to my country area and train in the Goju school oh, right. and all of a sudden I'm sparring these men strong men who previously were uh, too strong for me and it was just a matter of time before my Kyogushin Hombu influence style of Kumite started to become, become quite dominant, you know, and that's when I real that was the when I realized how it was making me much stronger. Because when you're there at Hombu, you don't notice it. That's very interesting. Yeah, because you would be with people of your own pedigree or higher. Uh, and yeah, and then to go back with people who perhaps didn't do Kumite that way. Wow, that's actually yeah. that's really that's interesting. It was, and and in the dojo in my country area, we trained twice a week. We're training. I was training at Hombu seven days a week, so that's probably four, not just three times better. Because I always figured if you train once a week, train twice a week, it's a little bit better than twice as good. Right. You train three times a week, it's better than three times as good. So if I'm training seven days a week, this 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 line of improvement is much steeper than if you train once a week and go this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it became quite, it was quite surprising to me what a difference it made. And what, what belt were you at that time when you were there? Were you already green showing? Belt. Oh, you were a green belt. Yes, I was a green belt and, uh, 
at that time when you go to Hombu, you'd automatically go back to white belt. Right. So this is why I think uh, Nick Pettis did such a, a great mm-hmm. job. I really like uh, his approach, his personality, you know, the way he, he, he didn't infatuate over his own strengths and abilities. He was always quite humble. He was very... He was very respectful of his senpai. So he would go, wow, that guy's good, that guy's good, and this guy's good. Yeah, but Nick, you just won that tournament and you won K. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, but these are guys are really good, you know. <laughs> I love it about Nick. And he, when he went into Uchideshi, he went back to White Belt. Mm-hmm. I think he probably was a, a shodan or something like that. Yeah, but he, he was. went I back to for the book, yeah. Belt. Is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you go to Uchideshi, you. Of course, there's first year, second year, third year, so that that hierarchy is very strict. But when you not only go to first year, you go back to white belt, then all of a sudden you've got blue belts and yellow belts telling you what to do, even though you've been training much longer than them. So that takes a real, you know, I, that that was pretty special, I thought. So I went back to white belt and I trained as a white belt uh, in Japan, and then when I came back after one year, um, I think the significance of the training really made a difference. So um, I got my brown belt. Frank Everett, my instructor, graded me the brown belt almost straight after I got back. They must have noticed a big difference in you too. Then after you got back, in your yeah, they did. Well, I was uh, I was called Little Cam in the dojo. They used to call me Little Cam. I hate Little Cam, you know. And even today, we have we have uh, there's one fellow named Kev Vivas, another one named Pete Smith, and another one named Rob Wall. Now, Kev Vivas is in his 60s. Pete Smith and Rob Wall are now in the 70s. There's one other fellow that I trained with, Peter Collis, but he's a couple of years younger than me. But we were all training together as white belts in the 70s mm. at Frank's Dojo, and we still all train together now. We, I mean, Pete Collis and I train together at my dojo every time where uh, we train. Uh, Rob Wall, Pete Smith, and Kev Vivas run a dojo just 15 minutes down the road, and we always get together for weekend training and uh, and uh, gradings and seminars and so on. That's so, so cool. We, it is very cool to see these guys. You know, who would have ever known that when I was 12 or 13 yeah. and they were 25, 26, that, you know, 40 years later, 45, nearly 50 years later, we're all still training together, you know. Yeah. So uh, I think I think uh, that's quite significant. And they were there. And then, you know, I was always little camp. That was my nickname. So when I got back from Japan, you know, I put on 10 kilograms. Um, I'm not little Cam anymore. And so Frank wanted to um, test me. Mm. So, you know, we're just doing normal training and Frank trained very hard. And then we started to do some kumite and everything. And one after the other, he's got me to spar all the top guys. And and I didn't realize because just after being in Japan for a while, it, it was just kumite, you know. You, you, I think if anything, when I first started Hombu, I was quite intimidated by <coughs> some of these people. There was one fellow there named Masuda, Masuda Senpai. Even when I was talking to Matsui Shoke, I remember once uh, he was t- asking me about training Hombu in the early days. And I said, well, I trained with Nakumura Tatsuo and, and Masuda Senpai. And he went, you train with Masuda Senpai? What was that like? You know, Nakamura Tatsuo, he, he, whilst I was in Japan in 76, he went off and lived in England. And he's the one that, you know, worked with Steve Arneal and, and created the kicking skills of guys like um, uh, Michael Thompson, Nick DaCosta, um, uh, what's – there's one beautiful, brilliant – Chogashin fighter in, from England in the second world tournament. His name's escaped me, but uh, just breathtakingly good. But he was, these guys were very strongly influenced by Nakamura Tatsuo's incredible kicking skills, you know. And, uh, but Masada Senpai was legendary. 
how good his kicks were. He was so funny because in Hombu, if you could imagine Hombu and up on the front right and the back left corner were full-size mirrors. Jeff Wybrow was the one I was thinking of mm-hmm. in England. He was just, he was legend. He's just, his karate was incredible. And he was very influential uh, with the development of the top level British fighters. But anyway, Mats- Masada Senpai was so funny because he was scary. Like he literally tried to, he was quite aggressive and everything. But I seemed to get on okay with him. But in Kumite, when he'd be doing Kumite, it was so funny because he'd, he'd manipulate his opponent until he was over in front of the mirror. And then he'd check himself out in the mirror and do a little bit of a, an Elvis <laughs> hair thing, and he'd go, boom, as he knocked them out cold. He'd just go, <laughs> and just style and then come back again, you know. And it used to be, you couldn't laugh because if you laughed, you'd be in big trouble. But it was just the funniest thing. And his kicks were just breathtaking. He was, you know... Uh, Oishi Senpai, Oishi Daigo Shihan, and Masuda Shihan, and um, uh, Nakamura Tatsu. These guys were just like legendary kickers. Mm. That's amazing. And it when, is. when uh, so you were, would have been getting closer to Sosai at that time uh, through either doing translations for him or, uh, you know, uh, different odd jobs doing translations was there ever did you find was there ever any jealousy from any of the other um uh, either those the students from japan or even foreigners or anything for your uh closeness with sosai i don't think so i mean first of all the foreigners are only two or three foreigners whilst i was there in japan at the time right there was one fellow from palestine and one fellow named jean I can't believe I forgot his name. It'll come to me again. But there was a French guy and a Palestinian guy. They're the two main guys that were there while I was training at Hombu. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... um, Or any of the other Japanese ones? Did they... Like this guy, No, I don't think the (laughs) Japanese... No, I don't think... I mean, if anything, the Japanese guys may have had this, um, you know, unfamiliarity with, with Gaijin. Right. It's not like they... You know, some of them, if anything, were probably more afraid of Gaijin there. They couldn't, they didn't know us any more than we knew them. Right. And, and the whole idea of being called up to Solsai's room and, and sitting with Solsai and talking to Solsai, it's not something that would make the Japanese jealous. You know, they understood the Senpai Kohei thing and they understood that whatever Solsai wanted, you had to do. Mm, so they understood that it wasn't, it wasn't, me initiating something special to get favor they just understood that it was something that had to be done so i don't i really you're responding I mean, look, to request in, yeah yeah i don't really i mean individuals are individuals so there, there may be japanese people who got jealous or something but i never the only time i ever saw japanese guys get angry with me was as a white belt i was you know i, I was better than the average white belt simply because i've been training for a few years mm-hmm. so i had a green belt so in Kumite, there was a very strict hierarchy. If you're a white belt, you know, you could put it on the white belts. But if you put it on a, a, a yellow belt or a green belt, and I remember one day in Kumite, I was sparring. There was this fairly good green belt. And, you, you know, you got to remember in those days at Hombu, these days as guys walk around with ninth dan, eighth dan, seventh dan, sixth dan, like they, they grow on trees. But back then, if a black belt walked into the dojo, it's like, wow, you know. And so I remember a couple of times there was a green belt there who was quite competitive. I think that's probably the nicest way to put it. I think, you know, he was, he was hunting for me, and, but I didn't want to back off because I felt, well, I was a green belt deep down anyway. So I remember one day I've, in Kumite he's put it on me and then I've come back and I've, I've you know, retaliated. And one of the other green belts took offense to that. You no a white belt, no a green belt, no no. You know? And so I had him for next round of Kumite. So he came and he was going to try and put it on me and all I did was just do what I had to do to survive, but I made sure that I gave it back to him as well. And I think that was the only time I had any real um conflict of or disagreement with anyone at Hombu was when 
I try to spar a little harder above my grade, right. you know, and that right. I was kind of breaking the senpai kohai rule sort of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. But other than that, no, no you know, I, I just think that they understood that it was whatever source I wanted, you'd, you'd, you'd bend over backwards to do for him. Yeah. Did you sustain any uh, injuries or illness when you were there during those times? I got pretty sick early on in the in the very early time I'd gone from a warm yeah I went over a, I arrived in Japan on January 17 1976 so it was quite chilly I'd gone from a warm Australia yeah. to a cold Japan it wasn't snowing at that time but when I got to Hombu uh, I remember I got a cold and I got a pretty bad cold and it was funny because I'd only been in Japan for like two weeks and all I wanted to do was go home. There's nothing worse than getting sick in a culture where you don't understand the people, you don't understand the language, you can't communicate with anyone. If anyone had said to me, do you want to go home, I would have gone, yeah, send me home. I just want to go home so I can get better. Yeah. But I think they knew that too. So I just kind of hung in there, got better. Uh and that was about it. In terms of injuries, I got uh, got whacked in the head a few times. Um, I got bad thigh corks from get on getty, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I tweaked my knee at one stage. I oh, and ribs. You always had, you know. I remember at one stage there, I had a pretty bad rib injury. But other than that, no, not really. You know, I was. You, when you're 17, you're, resilient. you're kind of you're resilient. Your body comes back, you know. Yeah. That, there was nothing big. And I think that sort of attitude towards it is really valuable. I mean, you can infatuate and exaggerate your injuries and use it as an excuse yeah. or a crutch. And that's the worst thing you can ever do, I think, you know, especially at that age. Mm -hmm. Is there any ad advice that you heard from Sosai that – always stuck with you or is it just everything <laughs> yeah everything about i mean i think if you analyze what source i says everything was profound but yeah. the one thing the one thing that at first i minimized i didn't really you know he would come down and say just be careful don't catch a cold stay healthy stay warm don't and i thought well that's really you know that's obvious mm -hmm. But then it took me years to realize that he wasn't just talking about catching a cold from the cold. He was talking about overtraining. And, you know, when you overtrain, oh, your immune system yeah. breaks down mm -hmm. and you easily catch a cold. Mm -hmm. And it was the significance of that kind of I didn't get for quite a long time. And I realized that it was more than just him saying stay warm out of the cold. He was saying, you know, manage your energy well, train hard. But make sure you eat well and you rest well and you don't overtrain. Train as hard as you can, but just be careful. That was his way. See, the concept of overtraining, I, I don't think I ever heard the concept of overtraining for the first 10 years of my life, you know. But that was his way of saying, here is your measuring stick. Are you training too hard or not? You have to allow the body to rest. Mm -hmm. But train as hard as you can. Soul size philosophy was train harder today than you did yesterday um, and that's a pretty good philosophy but it's essentially impossible when you think about the training intensities and levels and understanding that we have in the modern era so we have periodization and uh, you know we understand the importance of uh, rest and recovery much better but his way of monitoring rest and recovery was don't catch a cold yes you know and it's so Except, interesting yeah. because it does and yeah. In 2000, the year 2000, before the Sydney Olympics, I was invited to do some talks to the Australian uh, Olympic swimming team, mm. you know, because they um, they knew about the book and, and they knew about my training, Masayama. So they wanted to uh, – wanted me to come along and talk to the swimmers. Um, and then in that process, uh, I learnt – some of their training. It's funny, in the early days of my own dojo, I used to get a lot of my uh, training inspiration and ideas from a magazine called Swimming Technique. Isn't that funny? Interesting. Even though I wasn't a swimmer, I realized that 
when you're talking about, you know, the final of the Olympic 50 meter swim, the, all eight swimmers are within a fraction of a second. So the, the margins of between winning a gold medal and a silver medal in swimming are so minuscule that their training, their training concepts are, are literally, you know, the head of anything. So mm-hmm. I figured, all right, well, if, if swimmers are at the pointy edge of training innovation, let me see what I can learn from them. So I used to subscribe to a magazine called Swimming Technique. It's changed its name now and it's online. But and it was just fascinating to read about their approach to training and what they were doing. And, and uh, I learned a lot from that. But uh, one thing that I found, uh, one of my old Kyokushin friends had become a, a world-class uh, swimming coach. He trained many, many gold, Olympic gold medalists and so on. And I remember I used to go and watch his training right here at the Gold Coast. And they used to use heart rate as an indicator of, of training condition. Mm-hmm. And what the swimmers would do is they get up in the morning, the first thing they do is they get their heart rate measured or they measure it themselves. And if it was unusually high if it was five to ten beats higher than what it would normally be at a resting that was heart rate you mean resting heart rate yeah okay yeah Sorry. and you get up and you you could test your you know you wake up and roll over and test your resting heart rate if at that time your t- testing your, your resting heart rate was five to ten beats higher than what it normally would be that's an indicator that you're overtraining and if you're not careful your immune system is about to break down and if you pushed it, you'd end up with a cold or you'd end up. And so this was one very innovative thing. And so the swimmers, what they would do is if they woke up and their heart rate was a little higher, they'd rest that day mm-hmm. because the body needed rest because they were overtraining. And that was a very uh, interesting indicator of overtraining was that you wouldn't see it in the body yeah. before the heart rate was elevated. You wouldn't see you know, um, sore throat, sniffing, you wouldn't, the, the immune system was on the edge of breaking down. It hadn't broken down yet. Did you, so begin, that was, a, did you begin to apply any of those principles yourself then in your own training or training of others or anything? Yeah, a lot. We, yeah. you know, I think when I first started my Uchideshi training back in the uh, late eighties, mm-hmm. um, I'd taken the training that I had done at Hombu. Then I went back in 79, trained for three months, but I was in and out. I went back in uh, 84 and I lived in as an Uchi Deshi for three months training. And that three months, even though I, I went back to do my second dan, that's when I did my second dan in Japan. Uh, and it was a twofold purpose. One, I wanted to go and train at Hombu and do my second dan. But two, I wanted to really study the way Soul Side taught his Uchi Deshis. So I took a lot of notes and he would say things and I kept a journal. The Uchi Deshi have to keep a journal anyway, but this was a separate journal. I would I would keep notes about training content and uh, the week the day to day processes of you know what happened during the week of an Uchi Deshi and the morning training. You get up, you train, you go to breakfast, you recite the you re, you recite the dojo oath. Mm-hmm. The, the Uchideshi Oath and, and sing the morning song, all these sort of things I took notes about so that when I started my own Uchideshi training, I tried to replicate that as much as I could. So I, I see when people do Uchideshi training, uh, it's hard to do it if you actually have an experienced Uchideshi training uh, under Solsai perhaps in Japan or these days with someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of those traditions I preserved but I also introduced more modern training ideas. I, I had done my degree at university in Japanese, but I also did a sub, uh, a minor, a sub major in uh, human movements. Oh, and yeah, I was interested in finding out about that training. And so I, I was applying more scientific training methods to what we were doing. Uh, and when I look back on it now, even with the benefit of hindsight, there are certain things that I would tra- change again, of course. But we got results and, uh, you know, it worked. So it was a nice blend of the traditions of Hombu with uh, the scientific training methods and so on that I'd gathered mm-hmm. over the years. 
Mm. And when and when you were involved in that training under Sosai or at Humbu, was the where, where was the focus? Was it primarily on the sport kumite aspect, or was it really around all the elements of kihon, kata, and kumite? Yeah, it's funny. I I think it was more around fighting, really. <clears throat> yeah. From my memory, this is going back in the early '80s, uh, late '70s, early '80s. There wasn't much energy or time spent on kata, mm. honestly, at Hombu. Other dojos around Japan might have been doing it more, and but I don't think so. See, this was at a just after the first world tournament, and then the second world tournament. Then and I went into Uchideshi training at the time of the third world tournament. Mm -hmm. So everyone was just focused on sport day. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, it was just focused on winning tournaments, fighting hard. And the, I can remember once preparing for my second day and we had to do certain kata. And I, I had a, one of my buddies from home, from Uchideshi and I were discussing the bunkai. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what does this move mean? I think we were discussing, uh, Seipai or something like that. I said, what does this move mean? And he goes, well, that means this. I go, yeah, but couldn't it also mean this? He goes, no, it means this. <laughs> and it only means that. And you shouldn't even be thinking of anything else. This is, and I remember thinking, but hang on a sec. It doesn't work like that. You know, so uh, at that time, all, all you were interested in was fighting. Mm -hmm. That's all. What can I do to make my fighting better? Mm -hmm. That's all. Mm -hmm. And the kata was something that you had to learn for your grading. That was about it. Literally, this is my memory of it. Really, eh? And really? even uh, what you saw from Sosai, his focus was the same, do you think? No, I think his focus had gone way beyond that. You know, and What do you mean? It, it, well, he, he wasn't even doing kumite anymore. So right. he, he talked about what he called the shin soseiki. Soseiki means genesis. Okay. And Shin Soseki means the new genesis. And I think at the time of his passing, he was he was getting ready to make some significant changes. Really? And I, I believe so. And in the evolution of Kyokushin, you mean? Yes. He, it was. It's not. Un, it's not. It's not anything hidden. You know, at when he would have meetings with branch chiefs and so on, and I was interpreting Shin Soseki, the new genesis of Kyokushin, was on its way. He was describing. The, the 60s was the foundation. The 70s was uh, the period of, of growth and expansion. Mm -hmm. The 80s was consolidation and strengthening. And he said the 90s is going to be the Shin Soseki, the new genesis. Yeah, yeah. And I believe and the, the reason I think he – I don't want to put thoughts or words into his mouth. Of course. But my interpretation of, of this was – you know, the first world tournament fighters were now another generation. We'd gone through by, I fought in the fourth world tournament. So you had four world tournaments and you had guys like uh, Matsui, Andy Hug, Francisco Filio, Nick Da Costa, yes. um, um, Michael Thompson, all these top fighters now are a completely different generation. Yes. And the first generation now were becoming older. Yes. Yeah. And, and, a form of martial art that focuses virtually 100% on fighting is not going to offer anything significant for people who are no longer fighting in tournaments. Your body gets older. You've got to deal with the injury of hard training. Yes. Uh, yes. And I don't, I don't think you have to get injured, but the way we trained back then was it was pretty well inevitable that you were. It shouldn't have been, but it was. Mm -hmm. And I think... Um, uh, Solsai saw that there needed to be a change and I believe that the change was, okay, now we have to recreate Kyokushin not only to uh, accommodate the young, strong tournament fighters, but we also have to expand yes. karate to make it available for older generations as well. And that would mean a more spiritual side perhaps, introducing regular meditation and concepts of personal development, which didn't really exist deliberately in Kyogoshin. You would get you would get the benefits of training hard, you know, or develop, you know, the spirit of horse and all these sort of things, but that was secondary. Mm -hmm. You know. And I think the other area that he would probably uh, have addressed was uh, 
he would have gone back to pre Kokushin, pre tournament, which was the self defense and the bunkai and so on. And if you look at the work of Shihan Bobby Lowe, he yes. trained at Hombu well before tournament um, training became significant. So he and he travelled with Sol Sai as his personal minder and assistant, if you like, corner man when he was fighting a lot of those fights in in America and so on. So he had a body of knowledge of the self-defense stuff that Solsai taught. Now, people, you can go to Hombu to this day, and on the wall of the ground floor dojo is Solsai's menkyo in Aiki Jiu-Jitsu. So he received his teaching menkyo license in Aiki Jiu-Jitsu. He trained until fourth dan in a predominantly groundwork judo school. Mm. So he had developed his groundwork in judo to a high level. He had he had trained significantly in Aiki Jiu Jitsu to a level where he received a uh, a uh, teaching license. He was very close friends with Kimura Masahiko, the great judo player. Mm. And if you look back on Yamaguchi Gogen's Goju Dojo, the, there's a record of entry, and there was Yamaguchi Gogen was an eighth dan. Masoyama was an eighth dan in Goju, and uh, Kimura Masahiko was listed as an assistant instructor at the Goju Dojo. Interesting. And you know, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. And you know, Kimura Masahiko is not going to be teaching them how to do front kicks and so on. <laughs> what he's going to be teaching them is, yes. is grips and throws and controls, you see. And so I think there's this whole body of knowledge which was put to sleep because Solsai had to create a new Kokushin. And I think it's really significant that he was a Goju eighth dan when he started Oyama Dojo. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the old dojo, there was a sign that said Karate Jitsu, I think Karate Jitsu, Oyama Dojo, mm -hmm. Oyama Rokudan. So he had the humility to go from one style, start his own, and go back from eighth dan to sixth dan. These days, guys start their own style as a second dan or a third dan and instantly make themselves fourth dans and fifth yes. dans. And they got it around the wrong way. So this, I mean, to me, the dan system has completely lost meaning now. Yes. There are guys who yes. are seventh dan, sixth dan, sixth dan, seventh dan, eighth dan. Oh, there's an 11th dan, dan right now. I know. I graded. There's. I, I graded some of these guys to first dan and second dan, right. and now they're sixth and seventh dan and so on. You know, mm -hmm. so um, it's it's kind of lost its way. But when Solso talked about Shin Solseki, the new genesis, I tend to believe that he was going to go. Okay, well now let's look at this, where we're gone. We've achieved what we wanted to achieve. We've as a sport. Kyokushin, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. Kyokushin has established itself as a legitimate. Uh, style of karate it's recognized as a legitimate style of karate you know now it's time to uh uh expand it again and i think that's probably one area which wasn't ever addressed at hombu when i was a, a youngster which i think now in some of the different styles you look at what uh um Roy yamashi is doing kyokushin khan with the expansion yes. of bunkai and kata there yes. is quite significant uh I think uh, Oishi Shihan in Sokyokushin and Hasegawa Shihan. Hasegawa Shihan is more focused on the Kumite. Mm -hmm. Oishi Shihan is more focused on the Kata. So I think the quality of uh, the Kata there is just really quite incredible. You know, the, it, it wasn't there in the early days of Kyokushin in Japan. I like what you said that perhaps it, it's the, just the sleeping portion of Kyokushin that maybe needs to be uh, reawakened. Um, I, I really like that a lot. And, and even for myself, I mean, when you mentioned those books that you purchased as, as a kid and, and I purchased them as well, and I still have my copies here, those are focused. If you look at it, it's Masoyama and students doing self-defense or bunkai waza application. 100%, exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and they, they were all written well before the world, first right. world tournament. Is. Long before, yeah. So, yeah, the first world tournament was it, – it, it was – a significant change, but it didn't come with all benefits. There are a few drawbacks as well. Right. But I think the right. drawbacks were outweighed by the benefits. Well, maybe they're equal. But uh, it did make Chokushin develop this reputation as a strong fighting style. And there's, mm -hmm. and there's no doubt about it. You, you, know, you, you could train. You could go to Hombu and train for three to six months and come back and hold your own against pretty well 
uh, certainly anyone who'd been training three to six months elsewhere in the world. Right. But, you know, it was nothing to train three to six months in Hombu and come back and hold your own against somebody who'd been training three to six years, perhaps. So there were, there were a lot of benefits in that strong, hard approach to kumite and training. Mm -hmm. But the drawback was people look at Kokushin guys doing kata and giggle under their breath, you know, please, that's not a kata. Right. And all that's changing significantly now. Yeah. And, and this has come with the generations. You see, people my age, people, and so the, the first, I mean, you got guys from the first world tournament and second world tournament. I mean, they're dying of old age now. You know, it's a different generation, yeah. quite literally. Yeah. So now you have, and it's also, it's also gave us so much. And then we apply our brains to it and we add a bit more. And then we give that to our students and they apply their brain and they add a bit more. So it's from generation to generation. Kyokushin expands and people add on stuff and and people plagiarize stuff and sure. you know all that sort of stuff uh, and so Kyokushin now is quite significant Kyokushin kata are very beautiful and very significant and I think uh, you know with the introduction of uh, UFC C style mixed martial arts and so on it's made everyone take notice you know there's now there is less concern about which style you're with and more how practical and how realistic is what you're doing and that's you know if you're a dill if you're a, a bit silly you're still in your dojo doing your thing the way you were taught by your instructor but that's not the way tra training should be you you were shown something and you ask yourself how can I apply it to me mm -hmm. even salsai one of the most significant salsai significant thing Solsai said was, he said to me one day, there is no Kyokushin Karate. There's Cameron Karate, there's Scott Karate, mm -hmm. there's Tom Karate. You have to make the Karate your own. And he said, there's only ever one right way to do a technique. But if the way you do it knocks them out, that's the right way. <laughs> so he, he was, what he was, Kyokushin is a very freestyle mm -hmm. style of Karate. And it grows because it does the Bruce Lee thing of taking what works and discarding what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and and this is what uh, this is why I think Kyokushin will never stop growing. And from generation to generation, you have new kids coming on the block, and they're using their brain, and they have the benefits of fifty years of Kyokushin uh, experimentation and development and growth, and they're applying their brain to it and. You know, and they look around and they see these MMA guys and go, well, what would I do against a double leg? Or what would I do if someone tried to? And all of a sudden, it's going back to what Salsa used to teach in the pre-tournament days, you know, in, in the Aiki Jiu-Jitsu. And like you said, uh, what was taught in, in those early books. Mm -hmm. A lot of that stuff, if you look at it, you know, Salsa toured with Kimura Masahiko. You don't hang around with someone, the greatest judo player in history and not have a little bit rub off on you, you know? Of course. And, uh, you know, I, th I think this is, so I think the, cr the direction of Kyokushin is, is, is all good. It's heading in the right direction. That's nice to hear from you. Uh, so the evolution will continue. And maybe, oh, and so. maybe okay. come full circle. <laughs> yeah, there are certain aspects which really get my goat, you know, there's this constant splitting up and people just saying, well, I've been training for 20 years, 30 years. I have my own brain. I'm going to start my own Kyokushin organization, it doesn't work like that. To me, it just, it, it, I can understand why people find disagreement and conflict. And that's not their fault. That's the organization's fault. Yeah. You know, I remember many yeah. years ago, one of the greatest Kyokushin uh, personalities ever, ever is Kenny Urton Bogart from South Africa. And not only was he just a fantastic tournament fighter, but he had a really good brain as well when it came to um, administration and so on. And I remember at a branch chief meeting that I was interpreting, he, he got on the whiteboard and he started to illustrate the hierarchy of command in certain military style commands. And he said, and, and, the one of, and, and finally his conclusion was, and so we have this breakdown of command in Kyokushin at the moment where it's starting to find problems. And he turned around to Solsai and said, and Solsai, the problem is you. 
And so I kind of <laughs> was shocked and smiled a bit. But he appreciated Kenny Orton Bogart's honesty and intelligence. And it was right. And then you take Solsai out of that picture after Solsai passed away, it's got even worse. You know, everybody thinks that they're a Solsai. Everybody thinks they're a concho. Everybody thinks that they have the authority to grade themselves, you know, and then you have this competitiveness between all the different groups yeah. and, and, They'll go, well, if you come and train with us, we'll give you another grade. And so you've got guys hopping from one grade to from first down to second and third down. You've got young guys who are making themselves fifth down and sixth down. You don't even know. You know, when they train with in, with their own instructor, they were like a first down or second down. All of a sudden, they're a fifth down and, and they can do what they want. You know, it's up to them. It, it's just, but... It's a, it's the truth a, will come out. Yeah, and it, it reflects badly see. as a whole. Yeah, That's the problem. It starts to, you know, it makes Kyokushin a bit of a laughing stock now because we have no significant control system. We have so many different styles, uh, at least with, you know, I remember watching a beautiful documentary many years ago about a, uh, a kendo instructor who was grading for his sixth dan. For the twenty seventh year in a row, he'd failed his sixth down twenty seven years. You, incredible! I remember I mean, that. You, you get someone yeah. in Kyokushin that fails. Yes, in Kyokushin, someone fails their sixth down. They, there's not many people who have developed the humility to go. Or you know, there must be something wrong with what I'm doing. Instead, they go, "Well, up your bum, chump! I'm going to go and make myself a sixth down, and they'll start their own Kyokushin style." And it's like, and they. And they're nice people. All these people that do this stuff are, you know, generally they're nice people. Mm -hmm. They just don't understand that flow, that sent by Kohai thing, that that importance of humility and respect. Mm -hmm. And of course, they could write a whole book on humility and respect. They understand it intellectually, but it's just not in their blood, mm -hmm. you know. And it's and so I only just recently I did my sixth down in two thousand and seven, but I only just recently took my, my uh, I think, when I got my third Dan, it's because I graded for my second Dan in front of Solsai. Mm -hmm. When I got my third Dan, I kept the same belt, put another stripe on. When I got my fourth Dan, kept the same belt, put another stripe on. Mm -hmm. When I got my fifth Dan, someone stole my belt. It just, it, but it didn't matter, so I just went back to that belt because I liked it anyway because that's the one that Solsai had handed me physically. Mm. And I wore that belt right up until two or three months ago. That was the belt that I got in 1984 from Salsa. So it had just got to the point where it was just so um, threadbare and, and raggedy that I had to change. So I got my six stand belt that um, I got back then been sitting. It had got, it had shrunk. <laughs> it had shrunk over time. But anyway, I, I, I'd go and do seminars and things like this and I've got this little fourth stand belt on and I've got six stands there going, well, what gives? We thought you were a six Dan, you know. And if you look at my belt, a couple of the stripes were, were one of the stripes was not even really clear, so it almost looked like a third Dan belt. And here I am, I'm meant to be. A, I didn't. I, it got to the point to me, it became almost a personal protest. Mm. But that in itself then became an infatuation. So I tried to get away from that too. You know, when you when you want to personally protest over something, you're infatuating over your own right. uh, belief system. So I got rid of that too, and I just put the belt on, and I just people, I just said, well, whatever, you know, it's just a belt, you know, and uh, I just wear it. So oh, I, I was lucky, like I said, in the right place at the right time, people knew my name so I could get away with that. I could, yeah. you know. And with this fragmentation of all the, you know, of Kyokushin and all these organizations, are, are, are you currently affiliated with any of them or are you just on your own? Yeah, well, you know, I'm with Seoul Kyokushin, with um, Hasegawa Shihan and Oishi Shihan. Okay. And I like what they do. I, they, they are very loyal to, to, excuse me, to Seoul Sai. They're both significant personalities in the development of Kyokushin. Mm -hmm. uh, Hasegawa Shihan won the All Japan, the second All Japan. Mm -hmm. Oishi Shihan was, you know, he became legendary for his kicking skills in the first world tournament. Well, he's still you know, pretty good at it. They, <laughs> he's unbelievable. They yeah. both are. They both, you know, Hasegawa Shihan produces just some great fighters. Mm -hmm. uh, Oishi Shihan, I, 
you know, went and did a uh, seminar with him in India mm -hmm. uh, in uh, August, I believe. And, you know, he, he's in his mid-60s and he still just moves like he's a 25-year-old. Yeah, it's a great, I, you, I see you, video you, of it myself. You, it, it, it inspires me because I'm not getting any younger myself and I see somebody like him still doing that. It's so inspiring. It is. And the, the first thing is, okay, I'm just going to have to stop whining about my injuries. Yes. <laughs> because when this guy can do that, it just means if, if you train consistently – your body will stay youthful. But you have to train smart as well because I think the alignment of your joints yeah. and correct technique and having the body parts in the right place at the right time, all this stuff, it it has significance into your 40s and 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And when you, you train really hard without considering the alignment of the joints and so on, you're going to have hip replacements and knee replacements, and that's not a good thing. You know, it's it's not healthy. I, I totally, totally agree. Yeah, I, I think it's and possible so, too. I see, sorry. I, I think it's possible too to continue on. Yeah, I, I, it's it's very important. So I think uh, I I like to use acronyms mm -hmm. in uh, my training because. I don't know if they help the students to remember, but it certainly helps me to remember. Um, and I think flexibility training is becomes more significantly important even after you leave tournaments because flexibility will give you the incredible uh, skills. Mm -hmm. But most people think flexibility. You think flexibility, they talk about the hip joints. Yes. But that's only such a small fraction. Yes. I think – more important is is spinal flexibility and shoulder and hip flexibility because the more flexible your joints are, and I know there's argument against flexibility. I do I do a lot of football tackle coaching with the different codes of football, and some of those guys will tell you, well, we don't want to do flexibility training because if the joint is too flexible, it can open the door to injury, and that doesn't make sense to me yeah. because what they're not doing is – maintaining the support structure around the joint. If the joint is as flexible as it can be, mm -hmm. it's only a drawback if the joint strength and integrity aren't there. I understand, so, yeah. yeah. So what you have to do is if as you increase the flexibility of the joint, you also have to increase its integrity, its strength. You have to work the, the, the strength of the joint and then the, the supporting structure of the joint. And that way, flexibility is never going to be a drawback. Mm -hmm. And... So flexibility, Solsai, one of Solsai's um, most significant, isn't that funny? Every time I quote Solsai, I say one of the most significant things, was, but everything he said was significant. And one of, his, one of the things that he said was hard, full contact kumite is the lifeblood of karate. And the basics of kumite is kata. Oh, the interesting. Basic the basics of kata is idogeko, moving basics. Mm -hmm. The basics of ido basics, idogeko, is basics, kihon. Mm -hmm. And the basics of basics is flexibility. So Solsai said that everything comes from flexibility. That's and the hierarchy, I understand. That's the hierarchy. And not only in, in karate, but also in everything you could do. It doesn't matter what sport or activity you're doing. Mm -hmm. Flexibility is the foundation of it. And I always, you know, this is what Solsai taught. And so I grew up with this concept. I have a friend named Ian King. Mm -hmm. He and I went to the same boarding school. I was in his brother's year. He was a bit younger than me. But we also studied at the same university. And Ian King is, I would consider to be one of the most significant strength and conditioning coaches in the world. His, his concepts of training have become common practice throughout the world. You know, some of his innovations are now what everyone in every gym in the world is doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and he was very, very uh, creative. And and uh, and one of my former living students, Mitch Kachonda, it's funny how it goes around, but he became influential in my training as well because he went after Kokushin. He became a what they call a king mentored coach. Ian King runs training 
mentorships mm. and you can train to be a, a uh, athletic development coach under him. And Mitch Kachondra, a former Uchi Deshi uh, and Kyogushin Black Belt, became one of Ian King's King mentored coaches. And I did some sessions with him and just talking to him made me realize the significance of what my old mate Ian King is doing. And I think it's King Sports International. You can go online, King Sports International. One of the most innovative approaches to training that you will ever see. And every, there isn't a thing that he says or does that I've found in conflict with what Solsai taught me. He just has taken it to a, another level of scientific training. And he will. He said also that uh, flexibility is the key somatic uh, quality. Somatics as in the physical qualities of the body. We have flexibility, speed, strength, and cardiovascular endurance. And all other qualities come from those. And when I see that Ian King says that flexibility training is key, well, then it, it gelled because this is what Solsai said. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I just think it's in the practice then. You have, to, you have to go out and act on it. And flexibility training takes a lot of action. You can't get more flexible by thinking about it. You can pick up a good technique by watching the internet. Yep. And if you have a significant experienced brain, it makes sense to you immediately. You can, you can watch someone do something. You know, I like the way they do that. And you can experiment with it and get it almost straight away. But it doesn't work, work like that with flexibility no. or any of the somatics or strength or speed. It takes work. It takes action. And flexibility is the one quality that significantly impacts on all the other qualities mm -hmm. more than reverse. Yeah, and you could see it in aging populations as well, people when they get into their senior years. I mean, one of the first things that goes is that, that flexibility, and it seems to be then a domino effect. Uh, you know, from there. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I totally believe that, yeah. Exactly. And you look at when someone gets older, like they – and some people get old before their time. Yes. But you get you – look at, you look at people as they age, the, the most significant thing is a loss of spinal flexibility yes. and so on. The, the thing that makes them walk stiffly mm -hmm. is the loss of flexibility in their spine and so on. So I think the preservation of that flexibility through the, vibe, the body – is so important. And on that note, I, I remember reading somewhere that uh, you had done, you do yoga as well. Uh, and obviously, yes. a, a, a great Give me one to... sec. I just really, sorry to interrupt, Scott. No. I'm just looking, I just had a notice to say my battery powers down to 6%. So I'm just okay. going to see what, I thought it was plugged in, but it's not. Sorry. Not at all. Did you get to sort it out? Yeah, I did. Oh, good. Forgot to turn the plug on. Uh-huh. So, so yeah, so uh, back to the flexibility thing. I remember reading somewhere, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, you also were doing yoga and stuff. And I know, uh, having done yoga myself, there's always a great fl um, focus on flexibility, which honestly is only a small part of yoga. Uh, but uh, do you, is that, so did you practice or do you practice yoga? Yes. Well, you, you, you're exactly right when you say that it represents just a small part of yoga scott yes. the, the funny thing is yoga has gone through this tremendous boom over the last 20 years and people who know yoga i mean i've met people who are profoundly experienced in yoga mm -hmm. but they're experienced in the hatha yoga yes. which is the flexibility part which in terms of real yoga is so insignificant you know you have Patanjali's Eightfold Path, well, well Patanjali's Eight Steps, mm -hmm. Yam, Niyam, Pranayam, mm -hmm. uh, Yam, Niyam, Asan, Pranayam, and Asan is the third one. It just represents one step, which is a, pre a preparatory step to develop. Asan literally means the ability to maintain posture for a length of time so that you can meditate without uh, without interruption mm -hmm. if you're going to if you want to meditate you've got to meditate long if you want to meditate for four six eight hours if your body's not prepared for it you'll get sore and you'll you'll start to want to move mm -hmm. and as soon as you want to move the energy that you've taken inside mm -hmm. starts to go out again mm -hmm. you know you've got the yam niyam which are the do's and don'ts like the the, the 
the uh, the things you should do and the things you shouldn't do to prepare your consciousness for for life. And then you've got the asana and then pranayam. Pranayam is often translated as breath control, but yes. it literally means energy control. Yeah. And then you've got pratyahara. Pratyahara means internalization of the energy. So you've got this energy constantly running out through the senses. And you, if you want to make any significant personal growth, the first thing you've got to do is shut those senses down, return that energy back inside. So, But that's really hard. You know, when, when you're dealing with the, the demons inside your head, now you're talking about a completely different level of training. So it's much easier to stick to the body. Yeah. So this is why all these activities, including the martial arts, which offer so much potential in terms of uh, inner growth, people don't get to it because it's too hard. And in yoga, you've got 90% of the world who do yoga now, they're, they're, their flexibility is incredible. But that's, that's like getting really, really good basics, yeah. but never, ever learning a kata or doing kumite, you know. So the flexibility side of yoga is significant, but it represents such a small part of what yoga is about that um, I always go to great pains to explain the difference to people when they ask, but yeah, I did a lot of Ashtanga yoga. Yep, I and too. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, uh, doing that little bit of daily flexibility uh, is really, really vital. Uh, but it's also important to keep it in perspective. Uh, just because you can put both legs behind your head and do a, uh, you know, a vinyasa jump back without your legs touching, or you know. It doesn't, doesn't mean a thing if you've still got the demons running around inside your head. So people need to remember that yoga literally means the union of the individualized soul with the universal soul. And some people call it Yahweh, some call it God, some call it Mother of Nature. You call it what you want. It, it's all the same thing. But that's that's what life is about. It's not about becoming really flexible. Having said that, Good flexibility in the body is a really important aspect of maintaining youth over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What you just said sounds like the ultimate truth. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, this is where, you know, there's only so many ways you can live your life. We're all here for the same thing. Everybody bleeds. Everybody experiences emotional trauma. You know, that my yoga teacher is a, a man named Paramahansa Yogananda, and he wrote a very significant book called The Autobiography of the Yogi. Mm. And when Steve Jobs died, everybody who went to his funeral was gifted a box, and inside the box was this book, Autobiography of a Yogi. Oh, interesting. And that, yeah, it was interesting. And, and they say that on his Kindle, on his iPad, he only had one book, and that was the book, Autobiography of the Yogi. So if anybody wants to get a, a handle on the real meaning of life and what life's about. Read the autobiography of a yogi. It's a profound book. But uh, uh, Yogananda, who wrote the book, uh, is very significant about that. And he, he points out that every experience of everyone, whether it's the, the mass murderer or the philanthropist, Everyone's actions are aimed at exactly the same two things. One is a desire to remove some sense of pain or want, mm -hmm. and the other one is to ex experience unbroken happiness, which we mistake for pleasure. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't get that unbroken happiness by experiencing it through the phenomenal senses mm -hmm. because it doesn't work like that. If you're going to be happy, you're going to be sad. If you're going to be hot, you're going to be cold. You know, the world scientists will tell you that every – Truth has an exact opposite truth. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't have summer without winter. And people try to cut their lives in half. They go, oh, I just want to be happy. Well, it doesn't work like that, you know, you, you, because the, the world is a, a, a dual world. It's mm -hmm. a duality. So every experience is balanced by an opposite experience. Mm -hmm. Newton's second law, I think, you know, every action has an opposite. You know, even, you know, what you sow, you reap, the karmic law and the law. It doesn't matter which way you look at it. It, it balances out. So people need to recognize the difference between um, 
what it means to want to be happy or experience happiness and what it means to experience uh, inner peace and joy, which is a completely different thing, you know. Yeah. Is it ever? Yeah. Mm, getting oh. a little bit offline, aren't we? <laughs> no. Well, there is no line. That's the beautiful thing about it. And, uh, and, and, and I love your words. And it's, uh, yeah, it, uh, it's basically. And that's what the book was about. That, sorry, Scotty, but that, that's what, when I wrote that book, the, uh, the, uh, Buddha Karate Masayama. That's what I was just going to segue to right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes, it, it, that's what it was all about for me was to to show people that in actual fact, um, the path of the martial arts and the path of yoga are one. Mm -hmm. It's just that they focus on different aspects of it. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same uh, same destination. Um, and and on the line of the book, I I've actually not, haven't read your book because. I can't find your book, as you probably know. It's a, yeah. it's now a difficult thing. Um, how did the uh, well? I, I'd like to get into that as well. I, will it ever be republished or reproduced again? But before that, how did you actually? Uh, how did the book come about? I mean, you just gave a, a segue into it yourself just now. Um, well, I wrote it in 1987, so it's 30 years ago. Wow! Uh, and literally, it arose because. Uh, one day at the dojo, we're sitting around, and the stu one of the students says, "What does the word Saiyanshin mean? Mm. These katas have all different names. What's the meaning of Saiyanshin? What's the meaning of Seipai, of 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 Pinan, of Taikyoku?" And so I went home and I typed up a page of the meaning of the names of the kata, and then I added some terminology mm -hmm. and I that became a like a three page photocopied handout for the students so they get some Japanese terminology and the meaning of the names and then it went from there to well where do these names come from and what's the meaning of it and that's when it all started I think I've gone I've gone all right well it's it's zero or a hundred. I either give little bits and pieces of the meanings or I go all out and try and explain my approach to training. So that's when I decided, because I'd been following the teachings of Yogananda from the late 70s, mm -hmm. and I would constantly try to rationalize the similarities. I, I would constantly find more similarities than differences between the teachings of yoga and the teachings of martial arts and Masayama in particular. And also, in 1979, I went and did a week's training with uh, Tohei Koichi, who was an Aikido tenth dan, mm -hmm. and he was very significant in my early life. Before I could e even find the books of Masayama, I found an Aikido book called Key in Daily Life. And that became my little Bible. It became uh, the book that significantly encouraged me to train mm. uh, and connect that training to personal development. This was even before I was into yoga. Uh, and I mentioned earlier on a guy, a Japanese exchange student at high school named yeah. Shuji Ozeki. I brought, well, made I was, a note to bring that back around, actually, because you said there was a story there, yeah. Yeah, well, he, we, we were always good mates, and, and to this day, we're still good buddies. And in 1979, uh, I was in Tokyo training at Hombu, and somehow someone had mentioned, I think I met a Canadian guy, but Tohei Koichi, the 10th Dan Aikido guy who was very, in, uh, very influential in my life early on, was doing a week-long seminar mm -hmm. in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And by week-long seminar, it was like the training started at 6 a.m. every morning and would go till about 8.30 or 9. Oh, wow. And so I was meeting Shuji. He was in town as well. I said, look, Shuji, yeah, I'm looking forward to catching up. But listen, what I'm going to do is I'm, gonna, I'm doing this Aikido thing with Tohei-sensei. Uh, you know, I can meet you after that. He said, oh, what about if I come? I said, yeah, sure, come along. So we went together. And after, and I loved that week because training personally with Toei Koichi was just the bomb, you know. Mm. And he kept up Aikido. 
and now he's a third dan in Aikido, oh, wow. and he has a number of Aikido schools around the, the world that he travels to and teaches. <laughs> so, yeah, so we still have that connection because whenever he comes to Australia to uh, teach Aikido, we always catch up, and if I can, I'll go along and train his Aikido school as well. Wow, so the catalyst of his path in Aikido was you bringing him to that seminar. Well, I mean, you know, that, that was this, the coincidence that, yeah. you know, he, I'm sure he was interested before then. It was just, it was just the the opportunity he had to keep. And he ended up training with Maruyama Sensei, who was one of Toei Koichi's uh, living students, and he became one of his instructors in the end. So, uh, you know, I had this this interest in uh, the personal development potential of karate beyond the tournaments and so on, yeah. and in. In 1987, uh, I was preparing for the world tournament and I decided to go all out and write this book. And uh, I call it my little baby because it was from the day that I decided to the day that was published off the printing press was nine months. (laughs) <laughs> and it was a good it was a it was a painful pregnancy because I was also preparing for the world tournament and competing in tournaments and the book came off the printing press and into the boxes the morning that I was due to leave for Tokyo to go to the world tournament oh wow so i I grabbed six boxes of them and I got Mick Young was one of the Kyokushin, one of Australia's great Kyokushin fighters and he and a couple of the other guys they helped me take these books off to Japan because, you know, we took 60 kilograms of books and I presented it to Solsai at the world tournament. And Willie Schultz was one of my students who's a graphic designer. He designed the cover for me. And he also made this beautiful box, presentation box for Solsai with a beautiful gold brocade tassel and everything like this. Solsai knew that I was writing the book because I'd gone to Japan to speak to him about it and he supplied me all the photos in the book. But I don't think he had any concept of where I was going with the book. So when I presented him with the book in the box, he, I, I swear he almost cried because <laughs> the box was so beautiful. And, and you know, and then so that's that's the origin of the book. That's beautiful. And and like I said, I I actually haven't read it, and and I've been trying to find a copy, and it's uh, it seems to be out of print. Will it will it be coming back into print again? Yes, eventually. I'm not too sure when. I've written a second edition which was available online for a while, and then the company who was supplying the uh, online access Mm -hmm. was sold to another company, and they shut that arm of it down. So all of a sudden overnight, uh, the book was no longer available online. But now with the, uh, you know, technology the way it is and the the availability of, of EPUB and Kindle and so on, I'm pretty sure I'll uh, make it available online, but also... Uh, I'll make hard copies. I'll republish a hard copy. When I'm not too sure, but uh, yeah, I'll definitely do it because it's a whole new generation. It's 30 years ago that I wrote it, so there's a whole new generation of students who um, have never seen it, let alone you know really get the full picture of of who yeah. Solsai is and so. On. Yeah, yeah, I, I I think it's a very very important book, and uh, yeah, it'd be great to have it out there again. Um, I also. Uh, did you do some – you do BJJ as well, right? Yes. Uh, is, when did you start in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and is that something you still continue? Yeah. Um, I have a friend named John Donahue. Uh-huh. John Donahue brought Bill Wallace to Australia in about 1989, 1990 and he contacted me from Melbourne – And I arranged to organize the Brisbane leg of Bill Wallace's tour. Okay. So I'm John Donahue brought Bill Wallace up. Uh, I I became good friends with Bill Wallace and Benny Urquidez over the years, and they were very, very kind to my father when he was not well. Mm. And so I also met John Donahue then. So I became a friend of John Donahue's. Now, John Donahue is an Australian guy who went off to Los Angeles to train with Bill Wallace, and Bill Wallace introduced him to Gene LaBelle. Oh, and Gene yes. LaBelle, he became one of Gene LaBelle's, Gene LaBelle 
over the years only graded five people to black belt in yes. his grappling system, yes. and John Donahue is one of them. And Gene LaBelle introduced John to the Machado brothers, the BJJ Machado brothers. Mm -hmm. And John trained with them for 10 years and got his black belt and, you know, won the Pan Ams in the brown belt division and so on. And so he combined his um, Gene LaBelle grappling system black belt with his, his uh, Brazilian so, Jiu-Jitsu black belt. And he's an extremely accomplished in, instructor, teacher, as well as a uh, competitor. Now, in 1994... Uh, I'd gone over and trained with John in LA here and there. And in 94, there's a, a guy named Peter Debean who had been training with Carlos Gracie Jr. Mm -hmm. in Brazil. And he was bringing Carlos Gracie Jr. out with a couple of his students. Uh, one guy's um, Roberto Correa, who was known as Gordo. Yep. And another one was... Marcio Feitosa, and these these guys were like brown belts or something, and both of them went on between them. They won like ten or twelve world championships. Yeah, I'm but with this, them. It, yeah, yeah. Marcio Feitosa was just a young nineteen-year-old kid. So anyway, Pete the Bean contacted me and asked me if I could organise the Brisbane leg of of uh, Carlos Gracie Jr.'s seminar tour in 1994. So uh, I, that's what I did. I organised that and and uh, started training. I guess that's around the time, 93 or 94 was when I started to train Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And then around the same time, there's a, a SAW, Submission Arts Wrestling. There's a uh, Aso Sensei in Japan created this system of, of a hybrid stand-up plus grappling judo cross style of, of fighting called SAW, Submission Arts Wrestling. Very, very innovative, very ahead of its time. And one of his instructors, a, a young fellow named Toshiyuki Ito, had come to Brisbane and was teaching. And he was teaching at my dojo. So I, he was running submission arts. I think he was probably 10 years ahead of his time because people didn't get it. People were still at the point where they're going, well, why bother about that grappling stuff? If they come in, you just punch them. This is their, <laughs> you know, they still didn't get it. Yeah. Uh, Boy, that, that sure fast. changed. <laughs> Boy, and, and in a hurry. And yeah. anyone today, this is my opinion, I think in 10 years from now, if you're not teaching those aspects of training, you're kind of doing your students a disservice. Anyone today who hasn't significantly uh, considered and studied some of the grappling concepts in relation to their own art, I think they're doing their students a bit of a disservice because – you look at the early days of Kyokushin before tournaments, and there was so much of this in it. You look at Bunkai, yeah, yeah, and you can't you can't pull your hands together. You can't do a certain movement without relating it to the grappling significance of it, and and it was all denied for a long time. And then when the Gracies come along and kind of shock everybody, all of a sudden you had karate guys everywhere going, yeah, well, it was always in the karate. We just kind of hit it. And, you know, all of a sudden they're scrambling to try and show that they knew something about it. But they didn't really. I mean, if they knew something about it, they would have gone in and, you know, they, 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 they would have been able to do to the Gracies what the Gracies did to everyone else. Right. You know, so it was a big – it was a wake-up call for everybody. And by 94 – you know, I'd retired from tournaments. I was helping tournament fighters. But I also realized there are a lot of people in my dojo who were completely not interested in tournaments. Mm -hmm. They were there for self-defense. They were there to keep fit. You know, some guys are in their 40s and 50s. So what can you show them that is going to let them go home from training without bruised ribs and bruised thighs and so on, you know? And I just fell in love with the grappling aspects. And even in the early days when Solso was still alive, you know, I'd go off and I'd do kickboxing and I'd say to Sol, say, I'm doing kickboxing, I'm refereeing kickboxing now or, you know, I'm doing a little bit of, uh, of judo or this sort of thing. And, and because I was so communicative and open with him, I don't think he ever felt that there was any 
threat to my loyalty. And to this day, I'm 100% loyal to Kyokushin. But I, I love reawakening concepts that were put to sleep right. in the process of developing Kyokushin. So I love BJJ. I've been doing it since around 93 or 94 when Carlos Gracie Jr. came. I had a significant layoff because I became a single parent when my children were three and five. So I took a long time off uh, hard training to be a, a dad and bring my kids up. Mm -hmm. They're now 19 and 21 and, and uh, you know, it's a different world now. So for ever since they were, I don't know, in maybe high school days or late primary, early high school days, I was able to get back into training. John Donahue, my coach, is he lives 2,000 kilometers away, so I don't get to train with him any more than once every year or two years. But, uh, you know, I take his, his philosophy of training, I apply it. I have a little BJJ school. The students are doing really well, and we have a very specific approach to that training. Um, uh, another one of my good friends, Ryan Fiorenzi, teaches in – uh, America in Michigan, mm -hmm. and he's a he's also a member of the Yogananda Yoga Group, but he's a black belt under Higgin Machado. So my early days of training were mainly with the Machado brothers, mm -hmm. and then John Donahue introduced me to a wrestler named Rico Ciparelli, and Rico Ciparelli, Higgin Machado once said to me, you know, your friend Hiko, Hiko Ciparelli, he's the Hickson Gracie of the wrestling world, and on any day of the week, you could go to Rico's gym. R1 Jim it was called, and you had Randy Couture, Frank Trigg, Vlad Matsiensko, Higan Machado, Valid Ismael, all these guys, they're getting private lessons off Rico. Jesus, and wow. Rico, yeah, he was the Zen master. He was um, Dan Gable from uh, yep. Iowa Hawkeyes. Mm -hmm. They called him Dan Gable's golden boy. He wrestled for Hawkeyes, and I think he won um, three collegiate titles. World Cup. He was famous for training some fighters. I interviewed him once and said, what's your background? Everyone knows your fighters. He said, well, started when I was young because my dad was a local high school coach and I won the under 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 and 20 US wrestling championships. <laughs> so he was very, very influential in my grappling start side. I didn't want to just learn um, ground grappling. I also wanted to learn how to control and take down and and in, 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 I didn't want to become a Olympic wrestling champion mm -hmm. um, but I did want to be able to deal with get yourself out of a situation stuff. yeah yeah yes. and, and yeah. see in in my dojo we work on and it's not original I'm the way I approach it is original but the concept I'm, I'm sure is universal mm -hmm. and that is we work on five ranges we work on the kick range Mm -hmm. The punch range, the, what some call the trapping range, I call the headbutt elbow or the trapping range. Mm -hmm. The uh, stand-up grapple range, mm -hmm. which is a little bit closer to the headbutt elbow, mm -hmm. and the ground range. Mm -hmm. And you've got five ranges. And the thing that I teach the students is each range trumps the range before it. So you can be the best kicker in the world, but if someone has – knows how to bridge that gap and get inside your kicks, he trumps your kicks. That's interesting. You yeah, can be the best puncher in the world. You look at you look at great boxers, and the first thing that happens is when you get whacked, what do they do? They automatically shut down the range, go into trapping range, trap your arms up and so on. Mm -hmm. So the, that trapping range trumps the punch range. But if someone is trapping you, you're going to be working on your stand-up subs and your stand-up wrestling to – to counter the traps. So the stand-up grappling range counters the trapping range. But if someone is controlling you and they're big and strong, you take them to the ground and you you trump their stand-up grappling. So each range trumps the range before it. So if you don't have a concept of how to survive and escape that particular range, your martial arts is not complete. So also I said that you can't call yourself a martial artist if you're – well, that's putting the negative. He said to call yourself a martial artist, you must be aware of the potentials of all the different martial arts. And this is why I think Salsa grew up in a different era. He grew up where everything you did was tested under pressure. And so 
this became one of our significant teaching concepts in the dojo, mm -hmm. is what you are doing strong enough to work against a non-compliant, aggressive component who's bent on hurting you? Would that technique work against a non-compliant, aggressive opponent, opponent who's bent on hurting you? And you have to... You have to consider that with every technique. And even if it's a stand-up kumite technique, check this out. This is like a fake roundhouse. Da, 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 da. Yeah, but would it work under pressure in a tournament against a non-compliant opponent whose objective is to knock you out? Right. That's when you – that's that's the the yard – that's the measure. Goshen jitsu. And so – sorry? Goshen jitsu? Goshen. Yeah, Goshen jitsu is, is that art of self-protection, self protection self you know, uh, defense, if you like. Mm -hmm. I prefer not to call it self-defense, more self-protection because, you know, it goes much further than just the defensive side. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I started to look at things and, I, you know, you, you, you finish the last, you finish saying and you come forward and you step back like this. Well, what does this even mean? All of a sudden, you're doing certain movements and you think, wow, that just, that's a perfect way to deal with somebody trying to bridge the gap and take you down in a certain way. So the, it all tied in. And when the karate guys, the old karate guys, uh, or not old, but the, the guys who train in the more traditional Okinawan style say it's all in the kata. Well, it may all be in the kata, but it takes you years of yeah. significant um, training to dig it out. Yeah. You know. So then you – What's your experience with BJJ? Uh, a very uh, – very limited BJJ. Very limited. We we yeah. are lucky enough at our dojo to have somebody who is a three-time senior world champion. Um, so it's some training under him, but it's it's something that I want to, especially now as I'm getting older, I do want to focus more into. Uh, and my background before uh, Kyokushin was in more traditional karate styles and including in Kempo as well. Uh, and mm. where it was all, everything was application. Everything was mm. bunkai. Everything was what do you do if scenarios yeah um which was great but the one thing it was lacking though was that uh contact there was no there was no full contact not even full contact it was it was it was this it was very scenario so a person's just standing there in a static position uh there were it wasn't like as you said there was no non-compliant uh, opponent so i actually yeah, yeah. wanted to come into kyokushin later on in life because i wanted to experience that uh, I always say not only hitting somebody, but what it felt like to be hit. And uh, so, and I have done that now, and I, and, I, and I love it, and I love Kyokushin. It's become a, a great passion for me, but I'm trying to now kind of take it full circle back around again. Like, it, it, I like what you're saying around, like the sport and kumite aspects of Kyokushin are great, and I enjoy it, and I look forward to that sparring. It's really great, but... Uh, as I think, as I get older, there's so many other aspects uh, of the of the art that is that are important to me, and I and I do feel like they are inside there. They're like you said, are in the kata or they're, they're in the kihon. But we do need to, um, you know, extract them out. And uh, so that's yeah, a big part of my focus now. That's why I was curious about the the BJJ then grappling that you had done and what uh, what if anything had done to influence your karate. And it sounds like it has a lot in like in unlocking. Those things, like like you said, the parts of the kata where you're like, hmm, that could work here. Yeah, and it does. And you know, I've, I've written another book recently. It's just about finished. I'm just going through the editing process now. It's a training book, and oh. I've introduced a lot of these concepts in the training. And and uh, well, I won't reveal too much because I want to yeah. keep it for the book. But the most important thing is that uh, people, you know. Martial arts, Rico Ciparelli once said to me, you know, he he watched, he used to watch the Aikido guy. He loved martial arts. And then one day he saw one of the Aikido guys from the University Aikido Club get kind of beat up pretty easily in a bit of a fight down at the local pub. And he thought, wow, that's, that's strange. I thought this martial arts stuff worked really well. And his buddy said to him, oh, and all that martial arts stuff is all fake, you know, because they never – experience reality right and that and that's true it, it, all these styles they, it's a little bit of what i call it's like the, the corporate imperative it's like business has to show returns every three months to satisfy the financial returns for their shareholders but in actual fact the best thing they could do was just 
keep all that away for 10 years and just look, do a Warren Buffett and work on a long-term <laughs> plan. Well, it's, but you can't do that because as soon as martial arts becomes a profession, then you have this corporate imperative to keep the students happy so the right. cash flow keeps coming. So you don't want to hit too hard. You can't, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to expose people to reality. You want to put yourself on a pedestal and make people think that you've got something that they want. And so all the training is, and if you watch demos, martial arts demonstrations and so on, you know, they'll, they know this, but they'll disguise it very well. So they'll go, okay, well, you know, come on, hit me with a punch. And I just, I, I fell in love with so much of what Salsai was teaching in terms of certain techniques because if you say to somebody hit me with a right punch ready go well you could literally close your eyes <laughs> and there you go hit me with that right punch ready go and you go like that and you'll finish the tech because you know exactly where it's coming from but if you say to them all right come in like i just kicked your dog mm -hmm. and hit me with any technique that you want and I can tell you that no matter how good you are, the significance of the way you move changes completely. Yeah, 100%. So this is, this, that's the corporate imperative of the martial arts is this need to keep the students happy so they come back so that you have cash flow to feed your family and pay your mortgage. It's a catch-22. Yeah. But the reality is, yeah. yeah, this is what's beautiful about Kyokushin. In many respects, they go, well, like it or lump it, this is how we train. And if you don't want to come, that's okay because someone will take your place. And I think a lot of those styles, like I love the, the Kempo styles. They have so much uh, of value. But I, I wonder, could you throw 50% out of it, 50% out overnight, simply because 100%. under pressure and a non-compliant opponent, it just wouldn't work. That's, but you yeah. could, if, if you change the way you train, you could make it work. You know, no technique, you, you can't teach a six-year-old child a really good technique and expect him to pull it off against a strong adult simply because they don't have the willpower mm -hmm. and they don't have the physicality. Mm -hmm. So all technique takes an aggressive willpower and it also takes a strong body. Mm -hmm. So all those techniques that, that they practice in martial arts where, you know, they may not be that realistic because it's all prearranged, well, you can make it work. I mean, you can take good stuff from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if you just, that's the other side of it too. If you went purely non-sport, combative, combative uh, fighting systems, you'll end up with something that looks a little bit like Krav Maga. Right. You know, where it's just, you know, it addresses everything. It addresses the knives. It addresses the guns. It addresses, you know, it takes... It takes the Kyokushin rules, if you like, and throws out all the legal moves and focuses on the non-legal moves. Yeah. You know, we're going to gouge you in the eye. We're going to hit you in the nose. We're going to bite you. We're going to hit you in the groin. We're going to bite your finger and grind it so, you know, to get com pain compliance and so on. I mean, that's – they're all the things that really work. So you've got to constantly find this balance, but you have to be realistic as well. You can't – I think we have an incredible uh, – responsibility and duty to teach students things that really that are realistic and if they're not realistic you have to say to them you know what you got your black belt but it's not going to work you know well that, do anything you do. that's exactly what happened to me i mean I, I got a black belt in kempo uh in my 20s and um i i honestly say i, I didn't feel like a legitimate black belt i just didn't um, you know, it was great for all the scenario based stuff. I can make it look amazing and I can make it look flashy. I was fast. Um, but that was what a compliant person. And I mm. knew that if, if something actually went down, I was pretty sure that that stuff was going to go out the window. And that was actually taught mm. to me. I I still remember. And I talked about it in my blog, like my very first night of going to the Kyokushin Dojo, which was then later in my life. And pulling up there going, oh, my God, what am I doing, you know? And I walk in there, and it was a Friday night, and they're sparring. And sure enough, mm -hmm. um, I went in there as a white belt starting over and uh, and got my ass kicked. And not only my ass kicked, but uh, I gassed out immediately. Like I just mm – -hmm. I didn't experience anything like that before. 
Mm. And so all that training I had done for years was gone. It was just out the window. Mm. It was a survival. And it taught me a Mm. really valuable lesson. And I guess now that I've experienced that and, um, you know, uh, fighting somebody in in a real contact form, I guess I want to... Um, there's so much more in Kyokushin I want to approach. So I want to take all the, I mean, there's so many kata, I, I, I'd almost argue there's too many <laughs> in Kyokushin. And I think they're there for a reason. And, and because I have such a base in kata, I want to dissect them more, but actually make them relevant, as you said, in like a more combat scenario base. So for me, I, I see as Kyokushin is not just being a sport aspect, but a taking that uh, uh, philosophy of Kyokushin, the philosophy of, you know, um, perseverance if you will and 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 that hard style training and having it not just in sport but having it in utilizing aspects of kata or kihon in self-defense situations as well training the exact same you would way you would using bags using uh you know a pads all those types of things with a non uh a, a compliant partner and, and making it work yeah exactly and i think uh that's a really significant approach because um, you can't deny the incredible qualities that Kyokushin offers. Exactly, exactly. People will minimize Kyokushin. There's one of the, my favorite Kyokushin stories is Kenny Erton Bogart in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the South African Karate Federation didn't recognize Kyokushin as a legitimate style of karate. It was influenced by... Japan was going, well, no, that's just, you know, don't worry about it. They're just brawling karate. Right. And he said, what do you mean, you know, we're a legitimate style? He said, well, if you're a legitimate style, you come and compete in the South African karate championships and you'll see what real karate is. So he goes, okay. So he competed in the South African championships and won. <laughs> and he won. the. Uh, and you've got to remember, you know, the first, first karate team to beat the Japanese – in the Wuko style fighting was a British team of four fighters. Three of them were Kyokushin and the head coach was Steve Arneal. Right. So Kyokushin has significant presence in the early days of pre Kyokushin tournament karate. It's just when they went Kyokushin, they wanted Steve Arneal to take a significant role in Wuko after he beat the Japanese. He goes, well, I've got to make a decision. I either follow the, uh, non-contact Wuko or I focus on my Kyokushin so I'm going to focus on my Kyokushin and he left that behind mm-hmm. you know and and uh, yeah, for, Brian I'm, Pitkin, I'm, I'm with uh, the IFK five. actually so I'm familiar with that oh they, you, you know the story I, yeah. I mean I just you know Dave Pickthall and Ian Thorpe came yes. and stayed at the dojo in Australia many years ago in 1988 for about three weeks and they their training was just beautiful and in fact I got significantly influenced uh, by Dave he taught at the dojo for quite a few weeks and I learned so much. And Steve Arneal was influential in me as well because I thought I considered him to be one of the best karate teachers in the world. And when I wrote my book, uh, Budo Karate Masayama, I used notes that and, and parts of Steve Arneal's uh, syllabus approach. I used notes that I'd taken from talking to Steve Arneal in the writing of the book because it made such sense to me and it tied in with the proper progression through. So if if you're an IFK person and you've trained with Steve Arneal, you'll find uh, similarities between what I was trying to express in the book and what Steve Arneal teaches. Oh, cool. Very, very cool. Yeah, I've, I've had the honor of, of training under... Uh... Hanchi O'Neill and uh, and and Shihan David Pickel uh, and so yeah I know exactly what you mean they're absolutely uh, Shihan David's an amazing, amazing. teacher yeah. he's just yeah. great and yeah. a wonderful man yes I mean look incredible you know these are the the part of the legacy of Kyokushin you know? even though it's all split up and stuff, these people like Steve O'Neill and Dave Pickel and and the other people in IFK. You know, I mean, the UK doesn't suffer fools lightly. Yes. And the fighting world in UK doesn't suffer fools lightly. So if you're going to hold your own significantly, significantly in the martial arts in England, you better make sure your stuff is good. Mm-hmm. And and I think guys like that have served to bring 
to attention how good Kyokushin really is over the years. But it's, you know, when Dave Pickthall was out in 1988, you know, so that's 30 years ago next year. But still, the things that he showed us, I still teach in the dojo today. So there's particularly certain aspects of kata training and so on mm -hmm. that he did. And one thing I find now is I do a lot of seminars mm -hmm. and I try as far as possible to introduce original things. Um, anything I teach, I try to go... I try to teach something which is original. But if I teach something that isn't mine or if I teach something that was taught to me or is a concept that was taught to me that I developed, I'll always make sure I say it. So if I go and do a seminar and I go, okay, what we're going to do now is this. This is something that was showed to me by David Pickthall 30 years ago. <laughs> and I found it, I tested it over time with my own students and I found it to be significantly influential so i would recommend that you do it and this is it if i teach something that isn't mine see over the years of that book is 30 years old and i couldn't tell you how much has been plagiarized mm -hmm. I, I had one guy in america who wrote to me and said can i quote your book in the syllabus i said yeah sure just make sure you give a quote and i'm thinking a sentence here from cameron that and then one day taku nakataka in la said have you read so-and-so's syllabus? I said, oh, no, he told me he was going to quote the book. He said, no, no, you need to read it. So I got a copy of it and read it, and it was 90%. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a syllabus, it was a book, and it was 90% straight out of my book. And, But he'd had a lawyer get me to approve it, so there was nothing I could do. I mean, it was a little little mention in the pre part going right. thanks to Cameron Queen for letting us but he didn't give an indication how much what was right yeah and I actually went through one of his syllabuses with a, a, a pink highlighter and highlighted everything that was taken from the book and it's 90 percent straight out of the book and Ian King my friend who's the uh, uh, athletic development coach that I mentioned earlier his Stuff is so in, uh, so influential as well, and he actually wrote a book called Barbells and Bullshit. <laughs> and, it, and what he did was he's taken. I could mention some of the some significant names in the industry, mm -hmm. the strength and conditioning industry, who uh, have a reputation for being uh, world leaders in the game who have written books, and what he's done is he's gone to the book, he's gone, oh, I was reading so-and-so's book, and I read where he wrote this, and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Then I went back to my book that I wrote six years earlier, and this is what I found. And in some places, not only have they completely just copied and pasted from his book, they've at certain Ian King is a great coach, but he's not real big on grammar and spelling. And so, uh, you know, he, right. So they copy he gets, with mistakes. <laughs> he, yes. He wants to get the stuff out. He could spend more time getting it edited and it would delay the publication. Right. He just says, let me get the stuff out. You'll work your way through it. So in some places it's even included the grammar and spelling mistakes <laughs> of him. So there's no argument. And the book is just like, it's a thick book showing all the plagiarizations that haven't. And these guys aren't just plagiarizing. They're not going, this is something Ian King wrote. What they're saying is, oh, this is something I developed. Right. And I find the book has been so widely plagiarized. There's, there's copies of it going around that people have, have translated into different languages and so on. And, and people just copying it, for, you know, left, right, center. And it's the same with teaching. There are certain things which I felt was quite significant in my training. The main influences were Masayama's mindset approach, mm -hmm. Matsui's technical approach, yeah. because when I was training as an Uchi Deshi in Hombu in 84, uh, Matsui was my main instructor. Mm. And in 84, I was sitting down, in 85, I think I was sitting down with him, and he was nervous about fighting in the All Japan the next day. And I said, don't worry, you'll be fine. You know, there was a lot of pressure on him to win. And I said, look, if you win, I'll bring you, I'll buy an air ticket for you and bring you to Australia. And he won. And so it took a few years because he had the world championship, his 100-man kumite, then his world championship, 
before he could finally come to Australia. So he came to Australia in 1988 and I brought him out to Australia. So he, and he was in my dojo teaching for a month and his fundamental teaching ideas of how to align the body, do the techniques and so on were very influential. And then at the same time, David Pickthorn and Ian Thorpe were doing this tour around the world mm. and they heard Matsui was at the dojo in Brisbane. So they came and stayed at the dojo as well and trained for about three weeks. And their teaching stuff, Dave Pickthorn's teaching stuff especially, was so influential. So I want to make sure that people know that when I teach something that Matsui showed me or when I teach something that Dave Pickle showed me, I, I let them know. You know, this is stuff which we have worked on for many years but originally was shown to me by David Pickle. There's nothing worse than someone going off doing a seminar and going, oh, here's something I've been working on. Mm -hmm. And my students in the seminar will go, well, that kind of looks familiar. You know, we've been doing that for 20 years. You know, and, and uh, uh, I just think we all owe each other to be honest in the recognition of our sources. And if you've ever studied uh, at any level of, of tertiary education, mm -hmm. the, the quick way to put a dagger in your own heart yes. is to plagiarize someone and not talk about it. Yes. You know, so I think there's, there's no shame in going, in writing a paper and going, da, 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 little, little footnote, this is straight from so and so. Yeah. Rather yeah. than going da da da, and ten people out of a hundred read it and go, "Oh, that's straight out of so and so's book." Why didn't he acknowledge his source? You know, people aren't stupid. Mm -hmm. People can see what's going on. So, you know, I probably uh, that be, that importance of of recognizing recognizing your sources became more significant to me because of the book and the way it's been plagiarized and so on you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah I, I i've actually yeah i've quoted you myself in uh in my own blog but uh short short uh, excerpts and i made sure you got full <laughs> full yeah, quote there. Yeah. <laughs> but that was a lesson i i tend to believe that whatever happens yeah see the only thing you know well you can't control thing, that stuff no the you can't control anything outside yourself yeah so what happens is events occur in life mm -hmm. it's how you react to it emotionally that determines what you become through it mm -hmm. so some guy kicks you in the head of the dojo or some guy arm bars you and if your ego forces you to react emotionally and you get angry and you want to get even well then that's your mistake mm -hmm. because the event that happened is neutral mm -hmm. It's, there's no such thing as a malevolent event. Mm -hmm. Events are neutral. It's the it's the emotion we attach to it that causes it to be one thing or another. So uh, I tend to believe that emotions tend to be lies, that the only true reality is the heart's natural love, mm -hmm. and emotions draw you away from that. You take an event and you significantly exaggerate its importance. I met a guy recently, he used to be one of my students, and I said to him as a joke, 25 years ago, he said, oh, I'm, I'm uh, you know, representing da, da, da. And I go, yeah, you can't even fight. I wouldn't have said that if I didn't trust that he was confident in himself and was capable. If I thought he had self uh, um, confidence issues, of course you wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. You go, wow, that's great, congratulations. I go, okay, ah, come on, you can't even fight. I thought he'd go, ah, da, da. And then I meet him again 25 years later, and I shook his hand and say, how are you going? He goes, oh, I don't know, I want to talk to you. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you you, you minimize me when I don't know. Like, are you serious? <laughs> you know, so what happens is not important. What we become through it is. Yeah. And what determines whether something becomes uh, a lesson is the emotional charge we re we attached to it. Something happens, we exaggerate it like you wouldn't believe. You wouldn't believe what happened. Oh, this old lady in a little white car cut me off. I can't, you know, please, are you serious? It's just an old lady trying to drive in traffic. She probably didn't even see you. Yeah. But you take it so personally. 
So we exaggerate things. Well, the other thing we do is we minimize things. Yeah. You know, we and by that I mean, yeah, how'd you go in the tournament? Ah, yeah, I did all right. I did really well. But, you know, just they were better than me. Well, no, what happened was you didn't prepare properly. You need to take that lesson and apply it in your own training and ask yourself, where wasn't I prepared? Right. You know, so I'm always saying to the guys that the number one question you can ever ask yourself is, what would I do to beat me? And that way it reduces the exaggeration you have about your own self-worth. It constantly brings you back down to reality. So emotions drag us away from our reality. But once you're allowed, you're able to let things go, you realize that what happens or doesn't happen doesn't matter because it all serves. You know, anyone who's fought in tournaments who's had significant losses will tell you that they become the educational foundation of your training. Mm -hmm. But if you attach a a charge to it and think, ah, well, you know, he just got lucky or the referees ripped me off, you know, it's like you completely lose the, the, the lesson. You completely lose the picture. And so this is, I think, very important is, first of all, don't react emotionally to events because they're neutral and the only way you make them anything else is the emotional reaction you have. And there's a beautiful saying from Yogananda. He said, beware of the emotional reactions to the inevitable fluctuations of the phenomenal world. The world is phenomenal. That means it's a a duality. Mm -hmm. Good things, bad things. You just have to be careful of how you react to it emotionally. That's that's and once you get that, life changes completely. It's just like, yeah, you know, great. Everything becomes valuable. Everything serves. You don't get emotionally charged by people's comments you don't take personally anything that happens because you realize there's nothing really personal in it it's true it's it's, i gotta be honest it's something i battle with a long time myself uh you know uh, trying to not take things personally and uh and then start living in the past or future um i i actually um a few years ago i got really involved in uh, neuroscience and neurolinguistics and i I think i read somewhere that you you had some familiarity with nlp and and yeah i did some training yeah yeah and that really helped me um and this that trying to be more centered actually i i went to there was a yogi i went to see a few years ago i can't remember his name but he was visiting here in toronto from india and uh, I, I met with him after uh, after his talk. It was just a talk. We didn't actually do any physical movement. And uh, I asked him if any parting advice or anything he could give me. And uh, after our conversation, he said, well, yeah, you have one foot in the past and you have one foot in the future and you're pissing on your present. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, there you go. He's right. And it was that thing like it, it, it really resonated because I did take I would take things personally or r- ruminate on stuff and uh, – yeah, but don't beat yourself up about it because that's what everyone's doing. Right. I mean, where one of Yogananda's um, students once said, you know, if you're not where you're meant to be, for heaven's sake, where are you meant to be? Mm-hmm. You know, everyone says, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I shouldn't, this is not fair. Well, I mean, if you're not meant to be where you are, where are you meant to be? It's that simple. So the worst thing we can do is beat ourselves up because we're all here. We're because all we have fallible humans, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you know, just get on with it and just do your best. And you know, um, I think yeah. I think it, life is a lot easier when you reduce your emotional reactions to things. Yeah, yeah. So are you are you still teaching these days? I know you're doing. Are you, you were doing seminar work. Is that still happening? Yeah, I I do seminars all over the place, and I love doing seminars because it's a great way to introduce uh, concepts that I've been working on for a long time. Right. Um, I have two dojos, and I teach teach pretty well every day, Mm -hmm. except I have Thursday and I have Sundays off. But otherwise, I'm teaching Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. And I love it. That's great. Well, it, it, it's a purpose. It gives me purpose. And if I didn't love it, I wouldn't be doing it. And, and, and I mean, it is a labor of love to many things because I've attended some great business seminars and things like this. But the cost of, the cost of doing what a lot of these people want you to do is just too much for me. I, I, there is no way that I would sign people up to a contract and if they 
didn't fulfill their pay their fees one month, get a debt collector onto them and go, <laughs> yeah. well, this, this stuff doesn't it doesn't make sense to me mm-hmm. because you know it it's all about spreading soul size message and and changing people's lives through karate. But the seminars are a different thing. The, at home, at the dojo, I have all these little human experimental um, <laughs> entities for children, and and they become. Uh, I just love seeing the glow in their eyes and seeing. You know, you watch them at a grading, and their parents sometimes cry. They go, "This is impossible." That this is the same person as six months ago. You know, or you get other parents will come up and they'll look at some kid who has uh, certain problems. And the, the significant difference in their development, emotionally, psychologically, physically, uh, has these other parents coming up. I can't believe what this kid is doing. That's where it's all at. The seminars are aimed at people who have been training in Kyokushin right. for a significant la- amount of time and are now ready for the next step. So I just did a fantastic series of seminars in Norway. Mm. And... I did two night seminars and two three day weekend seminars. And it's an opportunity to share all my teaching concepts that I've been working on, particularly bunkai, kata bunkai, kata training, um, uh, tying in the significance of different techniques. That's also taught. It's, it's, uh, and I tell people, look, if you, if you want to spend the weekend training really hard and getting super fit, just go away and do that because we're not going to do that this weekend. Um, my my goal with the seminars is to share principles mm-hmm. that have worked for me and allow you to go away and take them and experiment with them and develop your own karate. Mm-hmm. I like that. I, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll say, well, the way you're doing that is good, but let's do this and add to it and see if it doesn't change your own training. So we'll, we'll work on different approaches to angles and leverage. Not just, I don't mean leverage in terms of getting the right fulcrum for an armbar. I mean leverage in terms of how do I change angles and time my technique so that I can leverage the impact of my punch or strike. I mean leverage in that respect. Mm-hmm. And if you can show people that, in actual fact, angles and timing create or optimize the effectiveness of your technique. I mean, you can be a second, third, fourth, fifth dan, and you'll still look at this stuff. Go, wow, this is quite significant. This is quite interesting. So, and and that's a nice time in my life to do that is uh, share a lot of this stuff that I've I've been working on, yeah. and share stuff that other people have shared with me. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, do you have any of those events coming up? What's your, what's in your uh, near future? Yep, uh, they must have, let people know about. Well, they must have. They must have liked me in Norway because they've got me booked in again next year. Uh, <laughs> Terry Burkett was trying to sort something out yes. over the last twelve months, but we weren't able to make it work. So we're doing. Um, a seminar in Wales with Terry Burkett. Terry's awesome. In he's, he's, as well. He's a real character. <laughs> yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, he's got a really innovative approach, approach to training. He does. And that's, that's the only way you're ever going to grow. Yeah. Um, in, I think on the 3rd of February, maybe the 2nd or 3rd of February, I'll look it up. Um, I'm doing a seminar in New York with Raul Dueño. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. He's in, uh, when is that? He's Sorry. in, in- it's in I'm just going to look it up. I, let me just check. I think it's maybe the 4th of February, I believe. When I do that, does that kind of shut my nope. – my, you can still see me? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to look for it, see if I can find the exact date here. Um, Mm, dun, dun, dun. Okay, I'm going to 
we can keep talking, talking, but while we're talking, I'm actually going to uh, Try look to up when I'm in New York. Yeah, yeah, I'd be curious about that. Uh, I mean, it's it's relatively close to me. Maybe I could actually get down for that one if the if the dates lined up. Yeah, I did one uh, last year for Raul as well. Mm-hmm. He is that in, and, in uh, Will you be in New York City or or is there a different part yes. of New York State? Oh yeah, okay. And, uh, and, I believe- and uh, mm-hmm. we're going to do like I, I, we're just going to do a, a three or four hour seminar, mm-hmm. and uh, you know it's it's a great opportunity just to introduce some fairly uh, key fundamentals that I like to share with people. Mm-hmm. So let me see. I believe here we go. Sunday the 4th. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Sunday the 4th of uh, February. I'm doing a seminar with um, Raul, Sensei Raul Duenio in uh, New York, in Brooklyn. That's great. Okay. He's a great guy. You know, he's, we have so much fun together. And uh, he's a very humble but serious Kyokushin instructor who has great history. You know, his early days he trained with... Uh, Kanamura Shihan, and, uh, and you know, he has some great, he's been around, and he's been there, and, uh, and so, and also my, my sister's daughter, uh, she won a scholarship to study at uh, Columbia University, yes. so she went over to New York, and I knew she wasn't a New York girl, so I contacted Raul, and I said, look, because he's a police officer, mm-hmm. and I said, "Look, you know, my niece is coming over there. Can I give her your number just in case she needs to contact someone?" And he not only said yes, he jumped at it, and he's become a good friend of my nieces and also my sister. Oh, that's who's so gone nice. Over. Yeah, so he's just a great guy. Yeah, that's one of the things I I like in, that I found in Kyokushin that I didn't find elsewhere. I found this. Uh, it's almost like a family. Like as soon as I if I'm traveling anywhere, if I'm anywhere. If they find out you're from that Kyokushin family, doesn't matter what organization either. It's just, us. how are you? I really, really enjoy that. Yeah. I love it. I think it's great. In fact, I remember once I was in Africa. I was in Johannesburg, and I was staying at a hotel, and I walked out, went for a walk, and I found a little lake not far from the hotel. Mm-hmm. And uh, I started I, – I, started to do some kata and I would go through all my kata and you said before you think there's too many kata, I agree, I, I think there's far too many kata, I mean it's, you know, it's just so hard to get a significant mastery of a kata when yes, you've exactly. got to learn two or three more, So, but anyway that's a separate yeah, yeah. Yeah. story, but here I am, I'm in the middle of Africa next to a lake under a tree doing my kata and some local Africans were there, uh, I think they were doing security for a nearby shopping center or something, and they started going, hey, and they're signaling to each other, and gradually there's one guy, I was kind of watching out the corner of my eye, and he circled around, and he's come around the lake, and I just kept doing my carter, and at one stage there, in the carter, I've turned around, and I've looked at him, and he's mimicking me, he's doing the <laughs> carter, and so I kept going, I finished the carter, I said, do you do karate? He said, yeah. I said, what do you do? He says, Kyokushin. Uh-huh. So here I, I couldn't believe it. And it was I was in Zimbabwe once. I went to the gym to train, and I had done a couple of their circuit training sessions, fitness sessions, mm-hmm. and these guys started to walk in in Kyokushin geese. I've gone, well, do you have a Kyokushin dojo here? They said, yeah. So I ran back to the hotel and grabbed my <laughs> gi and came back and trained Kyokushin with them. That's you know, awesome. so you can go anywhere in the world and – Mention Kyokushin and mention Solsai, and immediately, even when I did BJJ, when I started to train with the Machado brothers mm-hmm. in LA, Carlos Machado, he acknowledged Kyokushin and he acknowledged Solsai. He said, Yeah, he's, you know, he's one of the great heroes, you know. Wow. So, and this is in BJJ. Yeah. You know, and so Compliments you get the come, beauty. Uh, come hard in BJJ. So that's, that's great. Exactly, and Rico, Rico Ciparelli is like you've got – he's teaching Randy Couture. I ended up doing a lot of um, 
one-on-one -on -one work showing guys like Randy Couture leg kicks and punches and so on, and Dan Henderson who used to train. Mm -hmm. because, and, but that would not have happened if Rico Ciparelli didn't have respect for Kyoko Shin. Right, exactly. He would have gone, yeah, that's Cameron. Yeah, let's get back to training. Right. But I'd turn up at his gym and I'd wrestle with him and grapple with him, and he'd go, well, we've got a kickboxing class coming up. Can you take them on a session of kicks? I'll go to Eric Paulson's. I love doing training at Eric Paulson's. Yeah, and I, a couple I posted of a couple to today with you. I posted a couple of videos. I, I posted a couple of videos today from your uh, seminars you did at Eric Paulson's on kicking. Oh, there you go. You know, and yeah. I just I turned up to learn. I turned up to take part in his four day annual camp. Mm -hmm. But he respects Kokushin to the point where he'll go, "Well, can you show us something?" Right. You know. And I think this is just a testimony to how Kokushin is recognized by people who know it. Some people never even heard of it. I, but the ones that know it, know it, and they respect it. Yeah, I, I, I tell the story. I was I had not been training in Kyokushin very long. I was probably only training maybe probably about two years. And um, I, I was dating a girl at the time. And uh, she had a son, and her son was uh, uh, in karate. I think he was in Gojuru or something. Uh, it's irrelevant, but he was practicing, and he was he was working on this kata. And so we're off in this park, and uh, we're just out on one Saturday afternoon, and he's showing me his kata, and uh, and I was I was uh, it was a kata that we shared, so I was telling, kind of correcting his technique. And this guy comes up, and he says, uh, "Oh, the way that you're do moving your feet, it's incorrect." He's like, "You you should be you know swaying." Uh, you know, arcing your feet. And I said, no, no, no. Uh, I said, well, perhaps in your style, but in, in Kyokushin, we just go straight. And he's like, oh, Kyokushin. Oh, sorry. Really, <laughs> it was yeah. immediately. He was like, yeah. and I don't, I was nobody. I'd only been training Kyokushin for a couple, a uh, couple of years. And, uh, but immediately it was that respect, uh, you mm -hmm. know, and I forget what style he came from, but immediately just like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's so true. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's, that's, the beauty of uh, of Kyokushin and the realistic training that it offers. Yeah, you know, you're not going to get that respect. Sosai, as you know, Sosai said, without the experience of reality, there is no uh, yeah. proof. Yeah. Without proof, there's no respect. Without respect, there's without proof, there's no trust. And without trust, there's no respect. Yeah. So it's true. It all comes back to that Kyokushin style of training and mentality. Yeah, and that's like I said. I, now I want to take that into. Every aspect of that, uh, you know, from Kata Kihon, not just Kumite, but the entire mm. spectrum. Mm. Uh, we've been talking for almost three hours. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I just realized, I looked up at the Dang. clock. Yeah. Wow. So uh, it's, I'll try to wrap it up. Uh, but uh, any parting words, anything you want to let people know? Uh, I, first of all, I, I just want to thank you so much for this. It's been, I, I honestly could sit here for another three hours chatting with you, but I won't do that to you. Is there anything you want to uh, wrap up with? No, uh, thanks for the opportunity. No, I think, uh, no, I really, it's, it's great. And, and I just, if I can get, uh, I know it's, it's almost, you know, everyone says, well, I think if I can get soul size message out and it's not about me, it's about soul size, but really, you know, if if you acknowledge your sources mm -hmm. and recognize how influential people are in your life and you have a fundamental sense of loyalty to people, then you will naturally acknowledge them. So when I do seminars, I love – we didn't even talk about some of Soul Size philosophies or anything today, but I love bringing to people's attention – what sort of man Solsai was and, and how significant his impact is in the martial arts. And I love to recognize um, how important and valuable other styles are. Yes. You know, you yeah. can't, you can never deny the value of styles. My friend Rico Ciparelli says all forms are fluent. And it's true. If, if, if you can learn something, then learn it. It doesn't matter whether it's from a swimming training tool or whether it's from uh, traditional Aiki Jiu Jitsu mm -hmm. or whether it's from um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can't look at something and dismiss its value. 
if it if it offers value to you you need to embrace it and uh so that's what i love about the modern era of training and we people need to remember kyokushin is a combination of aiki jiu jitsu it's a combination i use to goju shotokan judo everything was there that all played a part in soul size um growth and development mm -hmm. yeah well thank you very very much i i really appreciate it um I, and i'm sure everyone who, who uh, listening or watching uh as well uh hopefully i get a chance to meet you in person maybe if i can make it down to new york for that seminar that'd be fantastic sure but, we'll contact raul but and, yeah. and you know if anyone's thinking about uh organizing a seminar get in touch because uh, uh yeah i was just gonna ask how what's the best way to get in touch with you um facebook yep it's always i'm always there at facebook uh you can email me at cameron at budokarate.com mm -hmm. uh or just you know you'll find me somewhere yeah contact someone but by all means you know uh I, I I love doing the seminars and sharing stuff with people. So you've been to Canada before, right? I think I saw something with Hugo Perez. Did you do? Yes, you... I did a seminar a few years ago with Hugo. It was a really nice seminar. I've trained once with uh, Stuart Corrigal okay. in in the uh, West Coast. Mm -hmm. I was just over there with work, and I did a train with him. And he's also another significantly um, historical figure in Kyokushin, you know. Uh, and he and his brother, um, and I did that seminar with Hugo, and that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, and you, we you need to get back to Canada. Yeah, we're talking about doing another one at some stage. So it's just a matter of when. Yeah. 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 All right, sir. Well, thank you again very right. very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Good on you, Scott, and appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Awesome. Thank you so much. Bye bye now. Awesome. Bye.